Hey, everybody, welcome to the podcast. My guest today is the world's only rabbi with a black belt in jujitsu, Rabbi Dr. Mordecai Finley. Rabbi Finley holds a doctorate in religion and social ethics from the University of Southern California. He's the rabbi and co-founder of Or HaTorah Synagogue in Los Angeles. He's taught at USC, USC School of Law and Loyola Law School. And he helped found and is a former president of the Academy for Jewish Religion. He's here today for what I think is a pretty extraordinary deep dive into timeless wisdom, mysticism, moral philosophy, spiritual psychology, stoicism, higher consciousness, and what it means to pursue a life of truth, of virtue, wisdom, depth, purpose, and meaning beyond the material. He's a beautiful man, so hit that subscribe button and let's dig in. This is me and Rabbi Mordecai Finley. So nice to meet you. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate you coming out here. It's a real pleasure and honor to meet you and be in on your podcast. I appreciate that. Well, we were introduced by our mutual friend, Steve Pressfield. Yep. Any friend of Steve is a friend of mine. Mutual. <laughs> he speaks very highly of you. And you know, I've been doing this podcast thing for about eight and a half years at this point. And over the years, I've had many a spiritual teacher, spiritual seeker in all types and forms, but I have yet to sit down with a rabbi. So I'm very excited <laughs> to talk to you today. Um, we were chatting a little bit before the podcast started about um, our, our, our mutual adoration for Steve and his focus on resistance. And you were commenting, I thought it'd be cool to kind of kick things off with your sort of um, rabbi take on what that means and how you interpret that. Mm-hmm. The uh, the Hebrew term uh, that matches onto resistance in Hebrew is called the yetzer hara. Mm. So the Hebrew word yetzer is from the word to shape or form and ra means bad or evil. So it says in the book of Genesis uh, chapter six, verse five, when God is as it were looking at, the, uh, at creation mm. and notes that the human being, that all the thoughts of his inner life are all bad all day long. Okay, it's, it's a pretty dour right. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> understanding of the human condition. Uh-huh. The divine is very disappointed, but in there it says, Kol yetzer libo, all the shapes of the thoughts of his heart are all bad. So from that, we get the term yetzer hara, destructive shape. So here's the idea that whatever's going on inside of you, however noble your vision, whatever it is you want to do, there's a spoiler. That sometimes the more you want to do something, mm the Yetzir Hara actually opposes you. It's not your friend. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhat connected to the Jungian idea of the shadow, but it's very active in the unconscious. So this idea is, it's just not well known in psychology. There's all kinds of ways they talk around the idea that there is an active intelligence in the inner life that is oppositional. Is that the same thing that you also call the inner Pharaoh? Uh, when, yes, one can call the inner Pharaoh. Yeah. So in, in the Jewish calendar, depending on what holiday we're working on, uh, we use the terminology for the holiday to discuss spiritual psychology. So there, the inner Pharaoh is an archetype for Passover time. Mm-hmm. But for the high holidays, we probably use a different metaphor. Uh, or for, for example, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, when we talk about penitence and self-examination and confession there, the resistance would be named differently. Mm. But I would say throughout Jewish spiritual psychology, including the spiritual psychology of the calendar, uh, the Yetzer Hara, the destructive patterns is an essential term. And what is the path towards deconstructing the Yetzer Hara? Um, so just a little bit of uh, background. Um, uh, the Hebrew word uh, heart or lev, lev does not mean what it means in English. So in English, we think of the heart as the seat of moral sentiments. But the Bible you probably know says, uh, do not follow after your heart or after your eyes, which you go astray. So people say, Rabbi, shouldn't I follow my heart? I say, actually the Bible says, don't follow your heart. Yeah. What does that mean? I said, because the word heart is something different. So the word lev, uh, which means heart in modern Hebrew as well. And I think it has that English connotation of follow your heart, but the Bible, sees the heart as something like the mind feeling continuum 
that's not connected to the, to the spirit, to the soul, to a vision. So in a sense, it's a lens, a prism through which the, the world is understood and then directs us according to its own needs. So I might, for example, let's say in my conscious self connected to my vision, I might want one thing, but my lev, right, wants something else. Right. It doesn't want difficult things. It wants the easier path. For some people, it wants to depress. Another person, it wants to dominate. Another person, it wants to be right. Another person feels guilt. So think of the inner life as having patterns. So the first step is to realize that we, uh, let's say in the, in the beginning state, um, we don't know that there is an inner world I call the ego self that's actually driving us. We think our will is driving us, but the ego self is driving us. Mm -hmm. So then, the, then if one wants to really do this work, you have to go to something called the higher self and examine the ego self. So that's the main thing. Right. You have to know what's happening in your ego self. Well, it presupposes that there is that there is this duality, right? Mm -hmm. That there is indeed something called the higher self. Mm -hmm. And then understanding what that is becomes mm -hmm. a tricky process, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I feel my sense is that most people lack the ability to truly live an examined life and are predominantly living, you know, as an expression of the ego for mm -hmm. the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and despite all the work that I've done, I'm probably driving my life on self well most of the time. And it's a constant reminder, like this refrain to come back to this idea of trying to connect with the higher self and discern the, 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 the truth of that in juxtaposition with you know, my, my ego driven will. Mm -hmm. So untangling that, you know, sticky wicket is is something I, I suspect that in your counseling you spend a lot of time trying to get people to understand. Yes, and, and, with. and that's one way I think Stephen Pressfield and I connected was because when um, he had already written the War of Art, and then he heard about that I'm teaching something very similar, so he came to study with me in my classes that I teach, and he saw that I have a very rigorous, detailed understanding of the inner life what exactly the higher self is, what exactly the ego self is, the distinction between the colloquial use of the word ego and ego self, because they're actually quite different. Mm. And he really admired the precision. And then we, he, we just, we met and talked about it constantly. And I learned a lot from him clearly because yeah. he's really suffered. He's really, he's really paid the dues of working through resistance. Mm -hmm. And I think he liked the idea that this, there is a, um, a concept that exists uh, that I've developed. And so our, our, our connection developed over that. Right. So uh, it, it is very important, I find. And, and, and this is where uh, I have to say to people, I'm gonna have to teach terminology. I'm gonna have to teach you a map because I believe that if one understands the map and understands how to use language precisely, it actually helps in the journey. So what are those terms that have to initially be concretely defined? So first of all, the ego self. Now here's where the term ego, the, put the Freudian sounds out completely because it, it's not helpful. But let's say when people say my ego got in my way, that has a sense of narcissism, um, domination, what I want. Mm -hmm. But many people suffer from guilt and shame. So they don't seem ego driven people. They seem like very nice people. So the flaw in their ego self is not narcissism, but self-loathing, self-doubt. So it's very hard to call that my ego got in my way. There is a narcissistic flair to that in that you're still the protagonist in this grand play, right? Things tend to re revolve around you, even if it's about self-pity and self-doubt. Mm, yeah, so that's a really at a higher level understanding of ego. Um, but most people, when they say my ego got in my way, they don't say, my ego narrative that is my narcissistic drama that I'm always at fault. Mm -hmm. That's a level of sophistication that, I mean, you have it, but many people don't. So that's why when I say, I mean ego self, because when I look at what I call the 20 or so disruptions of the ego self, anger at others, anger at the self, resentment, despair, shame, guilt, envy, confusion, low level desire, uh, I mean, the whole range of them. So these are all in the ego self. 
So when a person starts out on this work, they have to find a way to the higher self so they can actually watch the ego self. Mm -hmm. And so how do you tease that out of somebody? Okay, so the, the steps of the higher self start with what I call the observer mind, which most people do, but they don't do it in a rigorous proactive way. Uh, so I'll introduce somebody to uh, recounting for me a moment when what I call a, a disruption of their ego self took over their consciousness. And I gotta find out what their deal is whether it was anger, resentment, despair, confusion, guilt, shame, whatever it is. And I say, I want you to try to see it, but not be it. Mm. I want you to as it were, have some distance and you can see that it is happening to you, but it is not the same as you. Mm -hmm. And for some people that's, they can do that pretty quickly that they can disidentify from it. So the process of disidentifying it so you can see it and name it. There, there, there are little uh, quips here. Um, you can identify it if you can disidentify from it. If you can name it, you can tame it. Mm. If you can see it, you don't have to be it. Mm -hmm. So there's a series of, of um, ways that I teach it, but, but the, the, the moment is when a person says, I can see the anger without being angry, mm. but I can see it. That takes work in and of itself though, a lot right? Of work. For, you know, for, for most people, the minute you confront somebody with the truth of their lower emotional state, the impulse is to become defensive, Absolutely. right? It's a protectionism kind of reaction to that kind of thing. And, you know, as we were also chatting about before the podcast, like I come from, from a 12 step tradition, long time recovery guy. And in a very different, with a very, you know, with a, very, with a sort of analogous, but different set of tools, that whole journey and process is about getting you to objectively confront with the, you know, the factual state of, of your, you know, character defects and mm -hmm. behavioral reality. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Which is, uh, we also said before the podcast that two, two of the many influences uh, in my life, one of them is certainly 12 steps. I've been, you know, I, I'm not uh, officially in a 12 step program, but I've been 12 step world adjacent for uh -huh. my, my, almost my entire professional life. Uh, I was the informal chaplain of a, of a, 12, of a Jewish 12 step group back right. in the eighties. Oh, wow. And I've always stayed uh, uh -huh. connected. I'll tell you more about that once cause it was a, it was a life changing moment. Wow. Uh, first time I, I went to a 12, 12 step meeting. But in any case, the idea of being able to see what's happening in your ego self from the observer mind is the beginning of the journey. And so, the people that work with me, I say, you have to do this every day. Every single day, you have to do the practice of the disidentification from the ego self, observe what's happening. And then there are several next steps that I would uh, teach for the, what I'll call the beginner to intermediate. Mm. Now, why is that? Because at some level, I want to teach people uh, um, virtue, which is the ability to observe the ego self and not do whatever it says, but rather act in ways that are according to your vision for yourself, which requires a virtue code. Rationality to try to understand the inner life of the ego self, because every disruption has an inner life. Every disruption has a story. So anger has a story, depression has a story. So a person has to be able to rash, just like understanding another person, mm -hmm. you have to rationally understand what's happening in your ego self. So I call it the virtue rationality and then wisdom, you might say is um, developing a, a sense of how to manage this whole thing. So when we think of a wise person, they can regulate their ego selves, they live lives of virtue, but they also have a sense of where all this is heading the larger picture of a, a life of goodness. Mm -hmm. And beyond that is depth. Now, many people aren't that interested in depth, meaning the world of the soul. So if they can get virtue, rationality and wisdom down, they're good to go. Right, no, so, need, no need to go further. No need to go further. But there are many people that just have an innate aching for depth. And it's not well taught in it in this country. So yeah. I, I, I save that for people who, if they've gotten past, I mean, if they re have relative mastery of virtue, rationality and wisdom, then we can go to depth. Mm -hmm. One step at a time though. Yeah, I really think it's one step at a time. Cause there are many people who have to go to depth, but they can't manage their emotions. Yeah. They can't manage their connection with their spouses or kids or parents, so. Because we're emotional beings. We and emotional when you beings. talk about being able to objectively assess 
you know, the true status of how you're behaving, it involves decoupling all of those narratives and stories that we attach to our experiences mm-hmm. and things that, that, that we've done or, or you know, uh, kind of experienced throughout our lives. And, you know, we feel, I feel like human beings are, are predisposed to, you know, make sense of the world by storytelling. Mm-hmm. And so when something happens to us, we're like, this is why it happened. And then we, we, we you know, attach some disproportionately, <laughs> you know, emotional story to that. And that becomes our truth, right? Mm-hmm. That, 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 um, that the emotions that surround that become real whether or yes. not they're tethered to, to you know, factual reality. Yeah, and people reality. say, that's my truth. And in spiritual psychology, you should say, that's my lie. Right. <laughs> right? Uh-huh. And yeah. what happens when you confront people well, with when that? You, when you basically realize that your ego self produces mendacious narratives. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's actually quite relieving. Mm-hmm. That, that's just what the ego self does. It creates narratives that justifies your thoughts, feelings, and emotions. That's its job. Mm-hmm. So what's the job of a truly sentient, wise human being? Don't buy into it. Right, but it requires challenging your whole sense of self. Like it's, a, it's an attack on identity on some level. So I would suspect that over the years, you've developed a gracious set of tools for meeting people where they're at and, and very gently teasing these things out of them until they can uh, uh, lead with a sense of curiosity yeah, rather than uh, Yeah, it is curiosity. When you move to the observer mind, no judgment, just observe what's happening. And, but it, there is a definition of self because when people identify their ego self thoughts, feelings and emotions as the self, I say, you know, there is such a larger self that you're gonna discover and you wanna get out of that prison mm-hmm. because you're observing the world through prison bars. And if you think that's all there is, you're gonna stay in that cell. But if you are willing to accept the fact that there's actually a world, this is, this, this is not dissimilar to Plato's allegory of the cave. If you actually wanna break the shackles and prick out of those prison bars, there's a way. I say, and the, way, the main way you know you're living in that prison is suffering. Right. If you're suffering or you're causing other people to suffer unnecessarily, there's an indication that your, that your uh, identification of self is insufficient. But there's a competing idea that that suffering is serving that individual in some way, right? Like serving the, the, the attachment yeah. to that suffering is playing a role in how this person navigates throughout the world. And when you come to them and say, "You got to let go of this," and there's a there's a whole larger world available to you, it's a it's it is it's terrifying, right? So it unless somebody's in sufficient amount of pain, getting them to transition out of that. Mm-hmm is an uphill battle. It, it really is. So oftentimes when a person comes to me, it get, I, I have several, I call this wisdom counseling. I have several methods depending on the person. But let's say a person comes to me and says, hey, Rabbi, what's this all about? Give me the big picture before I sign up. So I'll say, all right, I want you to give me a theory of the good in your life, every part of your life, your romantic connections, children, work, and a relatively precise, uh, as detailed as possible, what you would like, what you would think, what would you feel, what you would say, how others would react to you as, as precise as possible. I call this a relatively precise vision for your life. Hmm. If you could live optimally, what would it be like? So it's not that I say you have to, I want them to say, I have to. I'm not, I say, I'm not telling you to do anything. Mm-hmm. But if you have a relatively detailed vision that you know yourself would lead to a life, uh, a flourishing life, this, the Greek idea of eudaimonia. Then the question is, what's the gap? Mm-hmm. And how do we close the gap? And if you wanna close the gap, I'll help you. What is the percentage of people that come to you who hold that vision for themselves versus the individual who comes in and says, look on paper, everything's good. Got a good job, drive a nice car. I've got a nice family. Sometimes my kids hate me, but I can pay the mortgage and I go to this job, it's fine, but there's something missing mm-hmm. in my life. I don't know what it is, but I feel this sense of, of calling to something greater, but I have no connection to what that might be. Yeah, it's not an uncommon question yeah. that I get. So then I have to say, uh, like, are you signing up? It's like, it's like my jujitsu club. Are you signing up? Because is, it, is this a one-off? It's a flirtation. I, yeah, it, it, yeah, if it's a one-off, that's fine. I'll, just, I'll give you a couple of ideas. And, but if you're signing up, which means 
You might come to my wisdom classes on, on Wednesday nights, come to one thing or another. Um, then I would start with, can we break this down? So you're not getting along with your kids. I need to know more about that because sometimes people suffer because they're not nourished by their interpersonal relationships. And let's say, for example, their estrangement with their child is killing them. Or I have a nice job, but some level they hate the job and mm-hmm. they're done with it. So when a person says, I'm basically doing okay, but something's missing. The first thing I have to do is find out exactly what's happening in each of these areas and see if something's missing in there. Typically something is. Typically they don't know how to process with the spouse. They don't know how to process with the kids. Their work life has you know, reached its maximum potential for, for meaning. So once we start examining things that I, the sense of something's missing, let's get to what exactly is missing. Now, let's say a person hardly ever, but a person reports relationships are good. I'm really regulated, we're processing. And I hear all that and I say, okay, so it's depth. Hmm. If you feel something missing, if you feel the abyss within, we call that depth and that takes hard work. Mm -hmm. And then what is the process going forward of getting somebody more connected to that? Oh, to depth? So we're, yeah. like, we're jumping to the end now, right? Yeah, yeah. We're talking like- I'm going AP course. Okay, man. So we're going already right to the yeah. brown belt, black belt level. Most people are happy with the blue belt. Mm. Okay, so if I, if I got that person who says, I'm not stopping until I get my higher belt. Um, so I use the approach of Jung, Carl Jung. Uh, um, not in any kind of doctrinaire uh, uh, sense, but Ultimately in the realm of the soul, it's a a meaning driven part of the inner life. It can be uh, addressed through religion, philosophy, art. Um, I think religion, philosophy and art come out of the soul. And I think the soul is the aspect of the human being that actually um, apprehends symbols, myths, poetry, music at the deep level. So we'll, we'll call mm-hmm. the soul a fac, minimally a faculty of knowing. Uh, James Hillman is one of my favorite people to study here. He says the soul is where events become experiences, where things are taken down. So first of all, um, uh, uh, the soul is always at work, but sometimes unnourished, unexpressed. And from Jung's perspective, that's why you suffer. Hmm. you suffer because you haven't found a way to let the concerns of the soul manifest into your life. So unlike Freud, where he, um, you know, Freud thought it was because of repression, uh, Jung thought it was more uh, the inability for a person to articulate the concerns of the soul into their lives. And then just comes some time for investigation. Hmm. Um, I gotta find out what, what, what medium they connect to immediately, music, movies, books, poetry, you know, and uh, now and then I get a person where the marriage is in trouble because the wife says, uh, I can't be married to a superficial man. So, uh-huh. you know, we've done it for 30 years and now I'm done. Right. She spent her weekends in Sedona. He says, I don't know what she's talking about. So it's an external pressure. Yes. And he said, what is this thing? And, you know, accountant, lawyer, and right. I, you know, like, and, and my <laughs> yeah. marriage is at stake. What do I do, uh-huh. Rabbi? I said, okay. So I tried to figure out like, where's the opening here? So I finally, he, he's a guy a little bit older than I am. I'm 66, about 70 and uh, music, rock music. I said, okay. I said, are you aware that the Beatles changed from 62 to 66? You know, that happened, right? Mm-hmm. He said, yeah, I said, I want you to go back and listen to the Beatles after 65, Abbey Road, Rubber Soul. I want you to tell me what happened. Okay. So um, he called me and said, okay, I found a better therapist. (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. I know, huh? But he got scared. He got scared because listen to Abbey Road, what's happening there? Listen to Rubber Soul, listen to Revolver. Right. You know, listen, what happened to or those guys? Sergeant Pepper. Sarge, Sergeant Pepper, yeah. exactly. And, and then I said, and tell me what happened to them. So I think he wanted to talk about his mother. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, how do you right, feel right, about right. it? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's yeah. A, it, it, was a, it was a spiritual awakening that they had. They went on a journey and they became more expanded individuals and in turn, more fully expressed artists. And it's scary. Right? Yeah, the Beatles, yes. Yeah, you know? and, and the thing is, 
I have a lot of compassion for that guy who comes to you. I think that's the predicament of the typical modern human because we live in a time that I would define as a crisis of consciousness and spiritual connection, right? We are, we're in this sort of uh, competitive predatory relationship with other people, with ourselves, with the world. It's a zero sum approach to basically everything. We're materialists seeking answers in ego status, money, power, consumption, accumulation. And it's also a culture in which it's considered a lower order naivete to seek reconciliation or answers in the mystical Mm -hmm. and the unknown, Mm -hmm. right? It's almost perceived as a weakness in this age of science. And yet Mm -hmm. when you look around, you see depression rates and suicide rates at unprecedented levels. We're seeing this breakdown in our ability to civilly communicate with each other. The seeds of social destruction have been sown, right? And from my perspective, the only way forward, the only salvation is in spiritual practice and learning to more deeply connect with who we are to find our innate humanity that allows us to connect to others and live more symbiotically on this planet that Mm -hmm. supports us. And yet I despair at times because I don't see that as a cultural priority. First of all, beautifully articulated. Really impressive. You you really nailed it. And I, I, it's not often that I sit in conversation with somebody who really articulates it as beautifully and concisely as you have. So oh, right on. All right. So the Thank first you. thing I want to say is one podcast one podcast at a time. You know, mm-hmm. but at a deeper level, well, that's my work. Mm-hmm. So um, you know, when I do my Torah teachings on Saturday mornings on Zoom now, this is what I'm after. I'm teaching it in order for people to master virtue, rationality, wisdom, and depth. And I, gotta, I have to teach in such a way where no matter what level they're at, white belt to black belt, I have something for everybody. And I remember uh, it was a few weeks ago, we got to this and um, you could almost feel the, the depth in the Zoom room. And one person shared a statement from Kafka where he said, um, language is like ice over a lake. I'm sorry, uh, there's ice over the lake of the soul and language is the ax. Mm. And we have to break through the ice to get to the water. And some great metaphor. And I mean, it's like, we were all in. Everybody was was saying, well, Cates and Wordsworth and William Blake. I mean, every all these quotes just beginning to flow in. And it's like, we all went into the zone. Um, so I know it's possible. Yeah. Uh, and for the people who weren't, at that level, they were listening in and say, well, how do I do this? I want more, I want to live more deeply. I want to live with a greater sense of my soul and the souls of other people. So part of it is to let people know that it's there, Yeah, that you're connected to the mystery, but the path is not that mysterious. It's actually a path. I mean, there is a, an incremental conscious path that one can take into the world of depth. And so part of my work is to make the journey to mystery apprehendable um, and, uh, and, and that people can master it according to their ability. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, I agree. And that's, yeah. I consider that be at the core of my life's work. We'll be back in a sec, but first, if you dig this podcast and I hope you dig this podcast, then I think you'll really enjoy my latest book, Voicing Change, featuring excerpts from poignant essays by and glorious photography of some 50 of my favorite guests over the last eight plus years of doing this thing, this podcast. It's a gorgeous, artful compendium of the show and copious wisdom shared therein, all wrapped in a hardcover coffee table form that provides a great taste of what we do here at the RRP and serves as a beautiful keepsake or gift for the ardent fan. The book is only and exclusively available on our website, signed copies are available and we are shipping globally direct to any coffee table on planet earth. So to learn more and snag your copy today, visit richroll.com slash VC. That's richroll.com slash VC. All right, let's get back into it. And, and your tools are, are the rabbinical traditions, social psychology, um, mysticism, Kabbalah, which I wanna talk a little bit about, but how do these all kind of congeal? Because my sense is that you're 
I wouldn't consider you an iconoclast, but you're you're different from the typical rabbi in that you're well steeped in military history. You've got a black belt in jujitsu. You were in the Marine Corps, and you have what I w- would consider to be, you know, a pretty objective lens on the pitfalls of religious traditions in mm-hmm. general. Sure. Yeah. Well. Um, yeah, a lot of life experience before I entertained the idea of becoming a rabbi. And um, so when I went to college, I began college at 22 years old after growing up and being in the military. And you were in the Marine Corps for three, uh, three, three years. years. Yeah, from eight, mm-hmm. I, I joined out of high school. And I also had a um, kind of a rocky time growing up. And I, I you know, I, I, I saw and experienced things that I know had an indelible effect on me that I had to deal with. I, uh, to just name it, I, I grew up in Compton as a as a white kid. Mm-hmm. And um, although my buddies on my street were fabulous, I mean, they fought for me. Um, I saw hatred and savagery that a person shouldn't have to see and experience when they're 12, 13, 14 years old. It never made me hate, uh, but it made me confused about the human condition. I didn't even know how to talk about it when I was that age. And so, I was in ninth grade, I was reading Camus and Sartre. I mm-hmm. just, it just something sprang open in me that said, I have to understand the human condition. So my first flirtation with, with existentialism, you know, we're thrown into an uncaring world and we have to create meaning ourselves. So um, that was a big part of my high school life and uh, um, it's interesting that your 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 on ramp really to the work that you do today was one that's that's rooted in philosophy, not religious tradition. So you didn't come up through you know the sort of uh, synagogue indoctrination of how you. I didn't take it seriously. Do what you do now. Mm-hmm. Look, I went to Hebrew school. I went to confirmation. You know, didn't connect with you then. Now it didn't connect me. I, I, I was in, incredibly fortunate that I had a spiritual teacher in high school. Again, it's just a rare thing that my science teacher was a, uh, a, spirit, a, a spiritual man uh, in, the, uh, was, um, in the Gurdjieff tradition. Have you ever heard of Gurdjieff? Uh-huh. Okay, so Gurdjieff was a great spiritual teacher in the uh, 20th century. Um, I mean, back in the 50s and 60s, everybody knew who Gurdjieff was. So he, 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 uh, he vetted me. I tell you a quick story. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm in science. That's what we're here for. Yeah. So I'm in, I'm in my science class at Linwood High School, and uh, he would talk and say, you know like the theory of spontaneous generation when they didn't understand where bacteria came from, and he would say some people believe that things spontaneously generate, but others know that everything generates from a deeper reality. And he looked right at me, mm-hmm. and then he'd move on. I said. Is he talking to me? Right. <laughs> so he would do this. Uh-huh. Right. He was just like talk and then look at me and like drill something in. So I came after school one day and I said, Okay, is, is this real? Are you actually stopping every now and then saying something to me at some really deep level? He said, Okay, I was waiting for you to notice and to ask. And I said, Yes, I noticed and I'm asking. He says, Do you want to study with me? I said, Sure. He says, Okay, every Wednesday afternoon, come to S 109, Mm -hmm. science class 109. And I would go every afternoon and he taught me about the soul and spirit and life and expanded consciousness. It wasn't on the curriculum, Uh, but, um, and he was a rigorous teacher. Yeah, that's wild. It was wild. Everybody needs somebody like that. You know, I felt too few get somebody like uh, that. How do you get somebody like that? How do you, I mean, I just felt so incredibly fortunate that he was there because, you know, I was, I was, this is LA in the, so I was coming apart. Mm-hmm. And he said, there's this great fellowship of human awareness. And there's not that many people, but when you are one, you can recognize others. And this is the most real thing. Mm. So he says, you got to take this seriously. So I was his student. And um, one, one thing I noticed was I was having trouble living up to it because there was drugs and alcohol and all these distractions. And I realized if I'm true to the deepest thing that I know, and I didn't get it from my synagogue. I got it from Jack Bishop. And I told Jack, I gotta get out of here. And I gotta go somewhere where they're gonna make me be this. And that's why I joined the Marine Corps. Mm. I joined the Marine Corps 
because you know they shave your heads and you can't talk for three months. I mean, I, mm. I wanted, I wanted them, I wanted the the eradication of that ego that I built up in high school down to the nothing and built up from there. That's what the Marine And you had this self awareness. You had that level of self awareness. I still. About that I'm, at the I'm time. sitting here thinking to myself when I was 17, 18. I really can't believe those were my actual thoughts. I need to eradicate myself and build from the core. Hmm. And um, so go into this institution, allow them to break you down where you're confronted with yourself in, in, in that very real way and yeah. rebuild yourself That's what under that kind of, that level of discipline and rigor. Yeah, yeah. and it did it. It, mm. was, it, was, it was true, it, it, it really did it. And what I discovered was in the, let's say a hundred guys in a platoon in, in a basic training platoon, about 20 were these guys. Really? There were so many wow. spiritual seekers. Mm. So when the, that was yeah. what year? 73. 73. 73. Yeah, so my drill, I had, so the, my drill instructor was one of them. Mm-hmm. You know, a person in the fellowship, I'll say for lack of a better term. So uh, he calls me in, you know. Uh, so the way you get called in was um, they'd, name a, they'd name a class of like a, a football players or whatever they needed. So he says, um, all Hebrew motherfuckers report to the duty office. Uh-huh. So they're all looking around. Okay, so I pound on the door, sir. One Hebrew motherfucker reporting his order, sir. I go in and he looks at me and he looks at my file and he says, I have a high EQ. He looks, he says, what are you doing here? So I, so I said, oh, I'll fight for my country. He goes, no, what are you really doing here? So I just, I'd be honest, this, I'm, I, I, want, I need to transform. I'm, I, I, <laughs> just kind of confessed mm-hmm. and he says, okay. He says, how many people in the Marine Corps do you think are like you? I said, one in a thousand. He said, one in 10,000. He says, so he says, don't tell anybody about it. Keep your mouth shut. He said, I'm gonna try, I'll try to help you. Wow. A little bit of a guardian angel. Whoa. And because he feared you'd get chewed up and spit out. Yeah. So he, in a way, I mean, he was a tough, Marine Corps drilling sergeant, but he had his eye out for me. And uh, it, it was crazy because, you know, okay. So w- one thing he did, it was he would play with our minds and he wanted to see who got it. So uh, one time we're at the chow hall and he says, uh, you know, we're standing here. He says, uh, uh, I PT physical trained a platoon to death. And the ghosts are here as, as are their ghost rifles. And every, I want everybody to pick up your ghost rifle because you think just because you're outside the chow hall, you don't have to do close order drill. He says, everybody get their, everybody get their rifle. Make sure you have the right rifle. Mm-hmm. Well, the guy's looking around. So I and the 20 other guys, we all start picking up ghost rifles. So then everybody says, oh, okay. So we all pick up our ghost rifles. He says, does everybody have the correct rifle? I said, this private doesn't, sir. So he goes, who in the fuck has Private Finley's rifle? So someone goes, sir, this private, would you please give it to rifle? So we're doing all this stuff. And the, uh-huh. the other guys are going, what is happening here? So he would play mind games with us the whole way through boot camp, And I and a few others got it, expand reality. It's mm-hmm. like my teacher in high school. I went from the high school teacher to the Marine Corps teacher. And the whole thing was, we're living in a world that you don't get. It's a mystery, open your minds up. So the flip side of that yeah. experience would have been for you to rather than join the Marine Corps to go to India and do the Ramdas thing, right? That's and what everybody sit, else was doing. Yeah, and sit at the feet of of Neem Karoli Baba, who essentially, you know, your platoon leader is a stand-in for that type of exactly. guru student teacher, you yeah. know, dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, I wanted the GI Bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, I was a patriot. Uh huh. You know, the Vietnam kind of destroyed our military. Everybody kept saying, oh, it's such a bad military. So why don't you join and make it better? So I, I was really the kind of guy that said, hey, that. we wanna rebuild this military. It's gonna be 1% at a time and I'm going in. Mm. I'm gonna do my part. Mm. So as a patriot, but more than anything, it was a spiritual search. And the idea that I landed from my high school teacher, Bishop, into my Marine Corps platoon with Sergeant Throneberry, who was, yeah, he was a guru. It, it just, it was so, Unreal to me, uh, Rich. I mean, truly, it was. Um, when you look back, hindsight's always twenty twenty, yeah. and life always makes perfect sense in the rearview mirror. Um, 
it feel there's this feeling of predestiny, right? Like you're you're sort of being prepared for this life that you live now. My feeling is that we all have chance encounters with great teachers and it's incumbent upon us to have the awareness to really see and understand when we're having one of those encounters so that we can value it and nurture it and appreciate it. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, I didn't feel predestination as much as I was working and doors opened because I was doing the work. But the doors that opened with Bishop and Throneberry, for example, felt miraculous. Mm -hmm. And they defined me as human beings. So then when it came time for me to go to college, I wanted to study religion because I wanted to get at the truth of things. So I did religion, anthropology, philosophy, and I had a really good undergraduate degree. I mean, I was really able to tailor make it to my spiritual search. I studied with, I read great books and studied with great people. Was there an idea that you'd be a professor or what was the sense I, of career path at that time? I had no goal time? other than discover the truth. Mm. I didn't, I actually, I was a B student in high school. I didn't know I'd be, a, so I was a straight A student in college. I didn't even know I had the aptitude to tell you the truth. Yeah. Uh, and then they said, professor, like, oh, you're professorial. And, um, and then I, I studied religion and I think I wanna be a rabbi. And, and my motivation was, I think rabbis sit around and study ancient tomes. Right. I forgot they have congregations. So when I showed up at rabbinical school and I got my slip of paper, here's your congregation. I said, what? <laughs> you have to get up and talk I, in front of people. I gotta, I gotta go out there and preach. I thought like we just kind of studied ancient antiquarian books and knew God. So mm. I, I was so naive. It, it, it wasn't until they gave me my assignment that I remembered, oh, congregational rabbi. Right. So, and that's how it began. Yeah, that's how it began. Yeah. So where, you know, where does the the interest in in all these other kind of strains of thought um, come in to you know how you practice being a rabbi? Well, so my religion degree, under, we focused in the uh, function of religion, not morphology, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the comparative approach. But do, what does religion do? Organize reality. Um, so we understood, for example, Marxism is a quasi religion, which you might call the, what's happening in politics today. Some of them are quasi religious because they're in a way based on things that cannot be empirically shown, but they believe to exist. So they have a, something of a religious quality to, to them. So we learned how religion functions. I also took symbolic anthropology. So I, the, the degree that I cobbled together for myself was foundational how we understand the world, human mm -hmm. consciousness, the nature of the symbolic life, introduction to Carl Jung, um, the whole history of uh, philosophical hermeneutics, uh, how language functions, the connection between language and consciousness. I mean, I, I really had an extraordinary undergraduate degree. Um, then I went to rabbinical school for a couple of years and I realized I don't know enough. So I went back and did a doctorate mm -hmm. in religion, social ethics, so I could understand this thing better. So I'm one of those few people I think that my, my degrees, both my undergraduate and PhD were part of my search for truth. And I, I just lucked into the best program with the best teachers who at some level let me do what I wanted. Hmm. And so I still am reaping benefits from my undergraduate and doctoral program. In rabbinical school, I mostly learned how to read the text. Meaning in rabbinical school, I learned how to do Talmud and Midrash and read Aramaic to study the Zohar. So that was a very good education in accessing the mysteries of the tradition. Um, but the intellectual tools I got from my, uh, mm -hmm. my, my two degrees from USC. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that trajectory uh, is still moving forward. I mean, here right, it is. Right, and, and, and how is your, like, Clearly the way that you kind of do what you do is a little bit askew from the typical rabbi. Mm -hmm. how, do the, how does the sort of Jewish community perceive you? Like, are you considered, like, is it, uh, certainly there's different, you know, traditional strains and orthodox and all of that, um, but are you like welcomed as an equal voice in this? Um, conversation that's a, that's or, is it, or is it, or I mean, what, you, I, what I hear is I'm highly respected. Yeah. That's what I hear. I'm a, I'm a reform ordained rabbi, but I'm not in the social justice thing. 
mean, there's enough people trying to fix society, fix other people, I'm not involved in. I wanna, I'm, I wanna aim at the human soul. So my colleagues know that I'm not the guy that you call when you want a social justice warrior. I'm the guy you call if you want access to the mysteries of the inner life. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not in step with what I'll call reform Judaism, but I think there's a lot of other rabbis in reform Judaism who are interested in this very thing. Very few of them got to start when they were 16, right? And have right. been, and have been on it since they were 16. So I, I think I have a, an important voice. And also because I studied Aramaic, which opened up the Zohar to me. So I, at a young age, I mastered skills that have opened up texts that some rabbis just mm -hmm. can't get to because they didn't spend time on the original languages. Mm -hmm. But many are, I'm not alone in this. There are, there are other reform rabbis that are equally deep, equally learned, uh, have mastery of the languages and we end up in similar places. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would imagine being so well versed and steeped in in a variety of traditions and philosophies and and uh, you know uh, traditions around psychology that that would really uh, uh, make your perspective on traditional Jewish philosophy and text much more robust. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I tell people I don't like theology. For example, theology wants to take the mystery and put it into a box with a nice bow. So I'm more interested in symbols, myths, metaphors as mediating between the conscious and the unconscious mm -hmm. mind. So I have a specific way that I teach people how to read a, a text as an entry, entryway into the soul. It just so happens that the, in the Hasidic tradition, which, is a, which branched off from the Kabbalah, that's also their main way. Uh, so when I, when I discovered a Hasidic text that says every word of the Bible and the prayer book is an opening uh, into a cavern filled with souls and worlds and angels. I shuddered. Oh, so you've been there too. Yeah, that's beautiful. Isn't it? So yeah. I discovered it by myself. And then I found out it's actually, it's a, it, it's a theory that goes back to the late 1700s. So when I discovered that, that the branch called Hasidic uh, Judaism, Hasidic doesn't mean ultra Orthodox. It's a specific kind of mystical teaching mm -hmm. that most of them happen to be ultra Orthodox. But once I discovered those worlds and those texts, man, that was, it's like I felt I discovered, you know, my people. Yeah. So I, I still yeah, am yeah, yeah. deeply immersed in, like last night I did a two hour, cause it's, it's a Jewish holiday last night and today. I did a, a two hour teaching on a couple of paragraphs from a Hasidic text from the 1870s. And we just went deeper and deeper and deeper. And, you know, I got off and people were saying to me, put it online and we have to study it and tell us what your sources were and, you know, so it's uh, yeah, it's extraordinary. Well, I love the I love the deep appreciation for the mystical, and I, you know when I think back to how we started this talking about Steve Pressfield and and resistance, one of the things that that I really appreciate about Stephen's work is that it's very practical. Like here's what you do if you're if you're dealing with resistance, here's a path towards you know overcoming mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. But within that, there's a whole universe of mysticism mm -hmm. because it's about courting the muse mm -hmm. and showing up for the work so mm -hmm. that the muse can become present. And I just find that life is, is, is more colorful and beautiful when we make room for things mystical. That, and it allows yeah. me to connect with my own innate, you know, with, with, with humility. As, as beautifully put, and, and I always remind people, the reason I want to deal with the disruptions of the ego self and deal with the resistance is to leave space, to live a life of wisdom. You know, so virtue, rationality, now we can, now we can actually live with some wisdom. We're not always putting out fires that the ego self creates. We're not always dealing with disruptions with other people. Um, relationships aren't always skidding into a, a, a car wreck. Okay, now, now you're ready for the mystery. Um, in fact, I just said to the rehab guys on Friday, uh, I talked about that, I said, sobriety prepares you for the mystery. Sobriety mm -hmm. is good in, in and of itself. But one thing, one, one thing that, that um, uh, using does, and again, this is a private theory, doesn't apply to everybody, the mystery is so deep and painful that people would rather drink and use drugs than 
to feel the, the, the pain of the mystery. Mm-hmm. And so for some people, sobriety is a way to say, I'm now gonna go into the mystery and it's, it's gonna be painful um, to discover the beauty that life is both beautiful and ephemeral, which is unbearable sometimes. Yeah. Do it anyway. And you're not gonna drink. Yeah. Well, you were sharing before the podcast about working with uh, people in recovery and and how receptive they are to these ideas, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. and I think my theory on that is that is that maybe not all, but a lot of addicts and alcoholics are fundamentally seekers. They're mm-hmm. seeking answers. They're seeking a resolution to their discomfort. They're doing it in, a, in an unhealthy way, and they're using substances as a portal to an alternative reality. Right? Mm-hmm. It works until it doesn't work. You're confronted with the truth of your behavior. You've got to find a new way forward. But because you had those experiences of, of trying to fill that hole, that spiritual hole, you're already predisposed to want to be on that journey. And I find that once somebody has built a solid foundation of sobriety, they're, they're thirsty. They're really, they're really hungry for that, that path. A hundred percent. Uh, and that's why for some people who once they gain sobriety and 12 steps is part of their lives forever, I say, and now go find a, a, whatever you grew up in, whatever you're comfortable with to go on the spiritual religious path, if it fits you, but you just have to find the right church, the right synagogue, the right mm. mosque. You, you have to find the one that's gonna speak to your soul. So I, I say to people, 12 step is necessary, but not sufficient for some people. Mm-hmm. It is a spiritual program, it is but how do you parse somebody who's, who's walking a spiritual path versus religion? That's a great question. And the distinction between spiritual and religious is a, is, is a tough one. Uh, religious sometimes means, let's say from a Jewish perspective, uh, you officially accept the dogma. Like, what do I got to believe? You know, one God, whatever. There's a buy-in. Yeah, just I buy into the dogma. Yeah. Now, depending on your denomination, you got to buy into enough ritual, you know, whatever your denomination is. And then you show up and you have community and there's fellowship. And as long as you stay within, you know, those, those four cubits. Um, but oftentimes when you start asking questions that no one else is asking and you're seeking deeper things at some point, you got to either find a couple of people in that church or synagogue, let's say, or find another one. And uh, Judaism is a religion more rooted in a common text and a common practice than a common theology. So you have, for example, uh, Aristotelians like Maimonides, you have the Kabbalah, and it's all one religion. Mm-hmm. So what I say to people is look, commit yourself to the text, commit to yourself to some ritual life because the ritual life has symbolic depth that reaches into the soul. Now find your particular path. Now find your teacher and your community. Mm-hmm. And that's what I recommend to anybody is mm-hmm. um, get a basic sense of, you know, is it Catholic, is it Protestant, is it Episcopalian? Like what the deal is, what you're comfortable with. Now go find the place that's hospitable to you, find the teacher and find, find, your, find your fellowship. Right. I think a lot of people find their way into religious institutions out of you know, some kind of family legacy or an attachment to you know, the cultural bells and whistles that go mm-hmm. along with it. There's certainly nothing wrong with that, but there's a very surface level engagement with the, with the actual teachings. And then an even broader gap between understanding those teachings and practicing them in your daily affairs. Absolutely. And there are people who show up in my synagogue and they say, my rabbi told me to come to you. I told my rabbi my concerns. He says, well, you gotta go to Finley. He says, he, I don't do what he does. And by reputation, he does it well. And I sometimes people come to me and they say, but what about Maimonides? What about Maimonides? I said, look, I'm not the guy. Hmm. I mean, there's a rabbi down the street who's all over Maimonides and Aristotle. I'm just not that guy. Or why don't you do more social justice work? I said, cause the other rabbis doing social justice work. So there is something of a, of a free market. And I think people need to go to the place that fits their needs. So I have this niche of, spirituality, depth, mysticism on one side, the virtue, the Greek tradition on the other, um, the Stoic tradition, you know, just over my life, I've just right. mastered many different traditions. And 
people who like this, this mix, they come to me. If they don't like the mix, they go to somebody else, which is- How does stoicism play into your counseling? Uh, thank you. So um, a very big part of my teaching has to do with uh, resilience or another way of saying dealing with resistance. And, um, but when I studied the Stoics, I realized that actually is a product of something deeper. And the something deeper is realizing the logos. So the logos is the most important idea of Stoicism, not resilience. So the logos is there, there's a fundamental order to the universe and therefore there's a fundamental order to human consciousness and therefore to the moral life. And if you don't live according to the logos, that's when you suffer. Hmm. So Stoicism is, I will live according to the logos no matter what. That's what the resilience is. There's a proper way to order my life and nothing's gonna throw me off how to order my life because I'm ordering my life according to the order of the universe. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea of the logos clearly comes into Christianity in the gospel of John, but the idea of that there's a, a mind of God emanated into our realm, I mean, that you have that in, uh, I think throughout Greek philosophy, you have it in Judaism, Christianity, Islam. Uh, so all of, all of them have idea of the logos. So the most important thing for me in studying Stoicism was not the resilience because that, that kind of came natural to me. You know, I mean, so many, there's so many Marine Corps legends. Mm -hmm. We hold the line, mm -hmm. they will not get any further. Or all I'm gonna die trying. That's like, that, that was the, mm -hmm. the mythos that I, into which I was inducted. Um, but the idea that there's a rational ordering to the universe and that if you don't align yourself with it, you'll suffer unnecessarily. That, that was something that I found really, really profound. That is interesting. I mean, I've, I've spent quite a bit of time with Ryan Holiday and I've read all his books and have read a fair amount of stoicism, but I'm not super familiar with that idea of logos. And when you were talking about it, I was drawing a comparison between stoicism as as a philosophy and how that differentiates from religion. But on some level, there's a buy-in with respect to the logos, mm -hmm. right? In that you have to believe that there is an ordered universe and that there are these natural laws that are at play mm -hmm. that require adherence on your part precisely, or suffering, right? So on some level, there is a religious flair to that Absolutely. philosophical. Yes, tradition. very well put. And um, that's why um, there are books on the stoic element in rabbinic Judaism, because rabbinic Judaism, for example, is many way propelled by the idea of a mitzvah, a commandment, whether you feel like it or not. So I'll give you an example. There are some Fridays when my wife and I are just exhausted from a tough week, but it's Friday. So we have to dress up. Mm -hmm. My wife picked flowers. We got to set the table. We don't feel like it but Shabbat is a mitzvah. So despite what we feel, we have to welcome the Sabbath bride into our home, which means we set the table, we put out the, the challah, the loaves, we set out the candles, my wife picks flowers from the garden and we create a little garden of Eden around our dining room table. And you know, our daughters grew up, it doesn't matter what else is going on. You gotta do the deal no matter what. You gotta do the deal, exactly. The mitzvah is more important than your feelings. So this idea, it doesn't matter what I feel. Now, look, we're not Orthodox. But the idea is when Friday night comes, I don't have a choice. I will snap my feelings around my duty. So that idea, so, so in the idea of mitzvah, a holy urging from God to which in general, you can't say no in general is a very stoic idea. It's your duty, it has to be done. But it's behavior based. Absolutely. Right. And this is where the, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with the idea of the outside in. First you do your duty and then it sinks in. Right. Because then when you do sit at the table and you sing the songs and you smell the flowers and we look at each other and, you know, we light the candles. Whenever we light the candles, I think of the uh, first from Proverbs, the light of God is the human soul. And I look at my wife and kids, whoever's at our table, and all of a sudden, man, I'm in. But you see, had I not yeah. just said, it's a duty. The, that dragged me to the table and put the candles out, candles are lit, light of God is the human soul, consciousness changes. You know what I call that? What's it? Mood follows action. Mood follows action. Yeah, exactly. which is something I learned in early sobriety. There you go. So, yeah. so that's for me, uh, stoic duty snaps you into the logos. Hmm. And for now, I'm not a orthodox stoic 
philosopher. So for me, part of the logos is love, justice, truth, and beauty. And beauty is a very big part of it. So one thing that, you know, for example, in the Jewish observance of the Sabbath, a big part of it is beauty. It's an interesting thing. If you don't make your table beautiful, you haven't observed the Sabbath. Mm. So we have an obligation to create beauty. I love that. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's a duty because beauty is one of the garments of God. Mm -hmm. So how can you experience God if you don't cultivate beauty in your life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's something I teach a lot, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, To that person who's a spiritual seeker, I said, what's your connection with beauty? They say, what does that matter? I want truth. I say, (laughs) beauty is a garment of God, just as much as love, justice, truth, and beauty. So you have to cultivate a connection with beauty. Yeah. They say, what do you recommend? Sergeant Peppers, <laughs> let's just right, start. Right, right, right. Start with what they're already- Start you know, with their, what, they, what they know. Yeah. Right. Um, as imperfect beings, we are all as humans. Um, a big part of this, and I know you've spoken about this, is the idea of, of essentially the daily inventory, right? Beginning mm-hmm. your day with an objective assessment of how you lived your life in the prior 24. Mm-hmm. Um, what does that look like in practice for you? So in my practice, I, I actually call this the wisdom practice, which is I, I'm sitting typically on my mat outside in the morning. I go to my observer mind. I look down at my ego self and I just run through ego, anger at others, anger at myself, resentment, despair, unresolved grief, uh, envy, guilt, shame. Just, I run across the, the you know, what I'll call the, the dirty dozen, you mm-hmm. know, whatever they are. And when I discover one, it's as if it, it's as if it perks up. It says, yeah, I'm, I'm active today. So then I wanna go in and find out. So for example, this is something I teach. Anger all, almost always means a frustrated need, expectation, entitlement, or demand. Right, the N-E-E-D yeah. acronym. That's the N-E-E-D acronym. Everybody who studies with me has to know this chapter and verse. Okay, so if I'm upset with somebody, it's not what they did. It's they, they, they disappointed my need. So I, I, wanna, I, I wanna stop being mesmerized by their deeds and focus on my needs. All right, now here's what happens. When you focus on your needs, your anger goes down 90% because mm. you're not transfixed by somebody else's behavior. So people say, well, what about what they did? I said, we'll get to them later. But is this not all rooted, two things. First, is this not all rooted in, in expectations around outcomes? Sure. There's Absolutely. that. And do these, are, are not these, all of these emotions really all rooted in fear? Like fear is the antecedent emotion from which all of these other Sort of yeah, I'm not convinced of that. Sometimes it's domination. Hmm. And sometimes aggressive dominant people are not motivated by fear. They're just motivated by domination. Hmm. And when they don't but get what their is way. That, what does that urge towards domination come from? Does it, it, it's this idea that somebody else, if somebody else gets it, I can't then. You know, I think there's a, that, that in the so-called alpha being, they're not motivated by fear. They really ultimately want domination and extinguish anybody who stands in their way. It's a type of person. Now, another person says, please stop. That's fear. Hmm. The person says, how dare you disobey me? They're not motivated by fear. I think think aggression and domination are are pretty pure as emotions. I I could be wrong here, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I don't think fear is an antecedent emotion. I think Mm. aggression and dominance uh, over others is primary. Um, I could be wrong, but... Mm -hmm. You know, th- there are times, like, let's say I find myself upset. Uh, you know, like, let's say I've asked my kids to do something like super clear, rational, and they just don't do it. And I feel angry. Like I asked you to do something clear, rational. I was, you know, when, and they just decided not to. So I see the, I see the anger. There's no fear there. I just don't like being disobeyed, mm-hmm. but I don't wanna be an angry guy. Okay, so I have a need expectation and talent demand that my child chose not to, uh, um, per, to perform. Mm-hmm. Now I have to look. And so my path is, um, was my need moral, rational and useful? And when I go to moral, rational and useful from a rational perspective, that's part of the dance with parents and children is children etching out independence by disobedience. It's not personal. Mm-hmm. 
it's part of healthy ego development of a child. So if I respond with anger, I'm stunting their growth. I'm not helping anybody. So I calm myself down. I say, okay, say, can I talk to you a minute? Sure. I said, so I asked you to do this. Yeah, dad, I'm sorry. It's not about sorry now because I have my coach hat and I have my authority hat. This is the coach hat. I want you to look inside yourself and I want you to find the meaning of the disobedience. See, I found the meaning of my anger, but I'm gonna get rid of it because what replaces the anger is my calling as a parent, which is to parent the soul of my child. So now I'm calm and I say, okay, this is actually a, a soul moment. So my child says, okay, I'm sorry. I said, sorry is for next right now. I want you to ask why that was meaningful to you to disobey me. They say, I don't know. I say, I have time. <laughs> I'm just imagining how this would play out with my kids. They'd be try like, it. Leave me alone. Like, no, try, try it. I mean, I've been doing it ever since they were seven yeah. or eight years old and they do something and you say, what happened in your inner life where that decision made sense? Hmm. They say, I don't know. I said, I know you don't know. And, and, and that's, what you, that's what it means to be a child in this family. Mm-hmm. Because your answer is, let me think or I'll look it up. That's something you're all trained. Mm-hmm. You can say, let me think or I'll look it up. After you say, I don't know. I see you, and- I know that you, I know that you, uh, you uh, made this commitment with your kids that you were never gonna be angry, right? And you put something on one of their doors saying, this is like a dad angry free zone or something, yeah, something like, like that. Right? Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, they all, yeah. Which, which I loved because it's really, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a challenge to the self, right? When you feel that impulse. And it made me think about all of these buttons that we have installed that are the result of the experiences that we've had or the traumas that we've survived. Wherein when they get pushed, we, you know, logic goes out the window and we just, we just impulsively react. Yeah. And it's only in the aftermath that we can reassess or feel guilt or shame or try to, repair the, the, whatever damage is done. But right. the trick is like, how do you uninstall those buttons or yeah. you know, kind of uh, um, untrigger them? Well, first of all, is the virtue practice, which is, as I call it the four C's. Um, I start with, I will not anger under any circumstances, under any provocation. Fine print, I will not criticize people, I will not complain to people about their behavior. I will not condemn other people. I will not engage in escalating conflict. Now I fail, but if I fail to my standard, I don't have an excuse, I Mm -hmm. just failed. Now I set that every day. I mean, when I wake up, I will not anger and I will not be defensive. I will not criticize, complain, condemn, or engage, engage in escalating conflict. Someone's upset with me, after a couple of tries, I'm not gonna engage what I call the bad Jedi, justifying, I have all these acronyms, okay? Bad Jedi, I've never heard that one. Oh yeah, the bad, I will not justify to an angry person after I try to explain my point of view, because oftentimes- I'm sorry, but. Never, oh my God, someone says that, I will set on my Uh boom squad, I will hunt them (laughs) down. I say to people, if you're gonna study with me, you never say, I'm sorry, but. An apology is an apology. And by the way, that's a big thing for some people, they've Mm -hmm. actually never heard the gold standard apology, okay? So anyway, so I will not justify, explain, defend, deny, try to give more information to a hostile person. So those are my, that, that's my mm. virtue practice under any conditions whatsoever. If I find myself upset, I say, okay, I've, I've already committed. I'm not gonna do it. Now my emotions are not obeying me. So what I call the wall of virtue steps between my emotions and my speech and behavior. I call this the wall of virtue. So I set up a wall of virtue that says, I can have anger. I can feel anger. I will not speak it. I will not act on it. Okay. So I say it hits the wall of virtue, Mm -hmm. bounces back into what I call a wisdom mill. So I got all kinds of cool names for this stuff. Okay. So that's that I set myself up and I, people who I work with, whom I work, they tell me about all the escalation. I say, okay, wall of virtue time. I do this, my, I have a Wednesday night wisdom class and it just began last week, wall of virtue. For the regulars, it was a great review. For new pump comers, it was the most stunning thing they had ever heard. <laughs> that when you get up in the morning, you set up a wall uh-huh. of virtue and there are no exceptions. And if you fail, you apologize. Mm. And that's, that's pretty stoic. It's a power, yeah, that's a powerful practice. I, I found that meditation and mindfulness go a long way towards creating that buffer. So 
if you visualize it like you're 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 inside of some kind of sphere as you navigate the world and like what's going to bounce off and what you're going to let in mm-hmm. how 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 porous is that membrane mindfulness or or a strict meditation practice just buys me that little moment of self reflection before i act and oftentimes that's the difference between doing something you're going to regret or aligning your actions with your values. Exactly, so that reflection practice is what I call my wisdom practice. But the wisdom practice taught me to do the virtue practice when I wake up. Because what people say is, I know I shouldn't have done it, my emotions got the better of me. I say, so your reflection creates a wall of virtue. And this is actually mind training the brain. Because what happens is there's a stimulus and a response. So I, I, I train people, what was the stimulus? Mm-hmm. My child disobeyed me, response, anger. I said, now I want you to try this. My child angers me, wall of virtue, train. And this is like martial arts. You know, like the beginner in jujitsu, someone mm-hmm. gets on top of you, what do you want? You want to push them off. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Arm lock. The instinct to push somebody off of you is inviting an arm lock. So whatever you're gonna do in jujitsu, do not push someone on top of you because you're saying, please arm lock me. Well, what do I do instead? I say, first, you're not gonna do that, right? What do you do instead? I say, okay, you hide your elbows in your hands and you move your hips. White belt the next week. I keep forgetting because you're a white belt. Right. So when you feel the instinct to push your arms up, instead you hide your hands and arms and turn on your hips and it takes six months. So it's called an intervention. When I get the stimulus, okay, now not, I don't have somebody on top of me, right? I have, let's say the disobedience of a child. I've trained myself that my response is gonna be wall of virtue, which is like hiding my arms and turning on my hips. Yeah, It takes training. So how do you train? I say, you wake up in the morning and you train. Yeah, I you don't, do the thing. You train yeah. to say, Wall of virtue, no anger, no four C's, no bad Jedi, train, train, train. And one day your kid's gonna say something, you're gonna go, wall of virtue. Mm. But good eye tra- good Jedi training is is the path, right? I, I, I often think, what would a Jedi do in this situation? Jedi never reacts, yeah. never loses their shit. Yeah, and Jedi's can have fun. They can joke and they're spontaneous, but the minute things go wrong, the Jedi says, oh, oh, we're in that space now, okay. Mm-hmm. There's an adult in the room, okay? I'm gonna hold down the moral center. So the kid does something say, oh, so you've changed the game. You're doing the disobedience game. Okay, I have a, I have a response to that. Yeah. But I'm not going to give myself a moral arm lock. Right. Because pushing is like arm lock me. Right. Like that's a white belt thing. Right. So you wanna go up in the belts? When someone does something to anger you, wall of virtue kicks in? Well, what you resist persists, right? In that, in that way, because if you're if you're in that context, you're allowing your child to do what they're doing. You're not pushing your arm out mm-hmm. to use the jujitsu mm-hmm. jiu- analogy. Um, you're kind of you know adjusting in a counterintuitive way, mm-hmm. um, but the pushing back is what then amplifies mm-hmm. the exactly. Conflict. So ideally, if my child does something. Um, Look, my kids are, my youngest is now 24, but still it can happen. And typically if she, if she does, and she'll probably listen to this, if she does something that I don't like, I'll probably say, yes, yeah, so that's not working for me right now. So I'll talk to you later. Uh-huh. And she'll say the same thing with me. She's said, dad, it's not working for me. And we disengage. Right. And then we'll talk about it later. Right. So the thing is you train yourself. When I feel anger, I go to the wall of virtue. And then I have a script waiting for me, which is, it's not working for me right now. Mm-hmm. Can we talk later? Mm-hmm. Now that's training. That's what a good blue belt can do. Right. You don't do what you feel like doing. You've, you've learned a next behavior and a purple belt, it's become their habit. They don't even have the instinct to make a wrong move because the, the game, they've ingested the game. Yeah, the training has been ingrained. Yeah, so you how, know this. How right often does, uh, Jiu-jitsu find its way into your <laughs> rabbinical sermon. Like I would imagine within, this is a constant. <laughs> yeah. 
right. It's a game with my congregation. Yeah. They have like a betting pool. <laughs> When's the rabbi going to mention 30 jiu-jitsu? seconds until he drops the, yeah. Exactly. Right. So I, it's a, it, they don't really have a betting pool, but it's almost that. Okay, Rabbi, we were just waiting until you mentioned jujitsu. So. Well, one of the amazing things about you is that you got, you, you not only got into jujitsu and became a black belt, you didn't start jujitsu until you were like 45. Is 45, that correct? Yeah. yeah. I was, a, I was one of those karate guys. And then I saw the Gracies at the UFC. Uh huh. I said, okay, I'm doing the, I'm doing the wrong martial art. Wow. And that brought you into it and yeah. you committed. I mean, how long did it take you to get a black belt? 15 years. Wow. Listen, I went through a heart attack and a herniated disc mm-hmm. and I was the longest blue belt ever. Well, I think you, three years ago. I, was, I got belt. my blue belt uh, in three years, 2000, mm-hmm. 2003. And then a heart attack in 06, which really set me back. And uh, herniated disc in 08. And so when you have a herniated disc, you have to learn everything again because yeah. you're back. Did you have surgery or how did oh, you yeah, rectify that? Through. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I stayed in. And you're I still at in. it? Still at it. Yeah. How often do you train? Uh, four times a week. Wow. Wow. Yeah. And so what are some of the other lessons that you've learned through martial arts that find, the, find their way well, into ju- jiu- jiu-jitsu timeless in particular, wisdom? I say jujitsu in particular is the way out is not where the pressure is. So for example, if someone has mounted me, you know, straddled me and they're pressing down on my neck, Mm -hmm. their hips are light by definition. They can't be equally heavy on their hips and their chest. So I feel chest pressure, I know their hips are light, okay? If their hips are heavy, I got space on my chest, okay? And so what you learn to do is you kind of feel where the other person is, don't get flustered. The big thing is the higher the belt, the more calm you stay. Uh Doesn't matter what their pressure is. And you start to detect where the, where the way out is, but you don't respond to pressure. When there's pressure, you figure out where the escape is. Mm. So that's one of the main things is uh, stay calm under pressure um, and uh, slow, slow them down, you know, hooks and angles, just gotta slow their progress down. And then from training, you know, you know where the escape is gonna be. Mm-hmm. So if somebody has a mean to choke, right? Sorry. Right. Somebody has a mean to choke. Um, I can tell by their choke what my escape's gonna be. So I don't, first of all, I don't get flustered. I just know that if you're, someone's choking you, they're both, they're both putting a move on and they're also giving something up by definition. And extrapolating on that, where's the, where's the wisdom that's applicable ah, okay. in other so areas So for example, of life. the spouse is pressing on you. So I get this, where the spouse is angry and pressing on you. They wanna throw their arms out, stop, stop. And so the idea is distract. Say, could you repeat that? What? No, I, that what you just said, that was really important. Mm. I don't know what I just said. Well, try to remember, honey. Right. And all of a sudden their ego self is just spinning because someone just said, can you repeat it? So when you ask someone to repeat something, they gotta, their eyes go up into the archive and their anger plummets 90%. Mm. It's a move. So there are many scripts for de-escalation. So fear does not help. So I say to people, are they gonna hit you? No, if they're gonna hit you, we have, we're having a different conversation, right? Okay, so your, your body's gone into fear because of their aggression, yes. And you know you're not gonna hit, right? Get it, yes. Okay, I'm gonna teach you some scripts that are similar to jujitsu moves. And so there are scripts you can use with the brain of an angry person that are almost infallible. Mm. That lead to de-escalation through distraction. Yeah, in box we call it deflection. Like I don't wanna hit somebody, but I know how to bob and weave and deflect. So when people say, well, they said this, I said, and so I said this, I said, you hit them back. I said, don't do that. Yeah. Just deflect, bob, weave through de-escalation techniques. So sometimes I actually train a person in five de-escalation techniques. So the thing is I'm being threatened. I have to be defensive. I get scared. All right, first thing is jujitsu, calm down. Mm-hmm. Just calm down. Well, you got to go back to the wall of virtue. There you go. Right? That's if it. you don't have that, then you're just gonna, you know, succumb to your basics. Exactly. Things. So one wall of virtue is for the angry person, and the other one is for the defensive person. Is you feel fear, go to your wall of virtue. I'm physically safe. Don't let thing let this thing escalate. Mm-hmm. Therefore, if a person, if you feel fear from a person who's not going to hurt you. Your job is to de-escalate, not to defend yourself. They're two different things. So the white belt wants to defend, the higher belt wants to de-escalate. Mm. And it's a, it's a learnable skill. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's an example where 
What your white belt self wants to do is not what the higher belt self knows is the right thing to do. And how do you do it? Train, train, mm -hmm. train, train. Are you the only rabbi that has a black belt in jujitsu? So far. Yeah. <laughs> No one else has come forth yet. And, and once they get it, they're coming for me. I know All that right now. listening out there. <laughs> the challenge has been they're placed. They're gonna, you know, when I got my black belt, man, I was, I was a hunted person. You know, yeah. Like, just the nature of the game. Uh -huh. Everybody wants to snag their first black belt. Right. So, anyway. It's a cool, it's, it's a really cool thing. Yeah, I love it, man. Yeah. I really, you know, I go in there and look, guys, guys are very respectful. Look, they know I'm 66 and, uh -huh. and you know, I have bad shoulders and a bad back. And But you're grappling with younger dudes, I, I would imagine. Big young yeah. guys and um, they're respectful, but they're there to train. So I can't say, hey, be nice to the old guy. I just say, just be careful with the old guy. Right, right. But they're there to train. I got to respect mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. I need to be a good training partner. I need to, you know, we're sparring. Right. Right, right, right. Um, for people that come in for your counseling, uh, I would imagine a lot of couples or people that are divorced or on the precipice of getting divorced, what are the kind of things that you're commonly seeing? Um, escalating arguments. Uh, sometimes taught in therapy to talk about their feelings, which is one of the worst things you can do when, you're, when, things, are, um, when you know, things are rocky. So they say, well, I told my spouse how I felt. I said, don't do that. In the beginning, don't talk about your feelings. So what do I talk about? I say, what exactly do you want them to do or not do in one sentence with a clean motivation and a clear goal? Well, I don't want them to get so, I said, what exactly do you want them to do now with a clean motivation and a clear goal that is observable? And people are just so perplexed the idea of it's not about my feelings, we'd like them to do. So one person says, well, I would like my husband to apologize. I said, well, ask him, say, honey, I'd like to apologize for what you said. I look at him, he said, I don't have to apologize. Just say no, say no. You don't have to go into a big story. Just say, I choose to not apologize. I look at, let's say the woman in this case of the, this couple, I'll say, now you'll have to learn to take no for an answer. It's a skill. Take no for an answer. I'd like you to apologize. I choose not to, okay. But how can I take no for an answer? Because anything you say next will escalate and you'll be back where you started. But is there not room for acknowledging the feelings in the context of making that ask? After so about a that, month. Because if you're, if you're to say, listen, I'm, the reason I'm asking for this apology is because when you did this, it made me feel unseen or it, like if you could like get past the reactionary response in the moment to what's behind it. Like yeah. I feel unappreciated or whatever the after case may be. After about a month, after about a month. Because right. what, what will happen if you say, I feel unseen, I feel unseen. Oh, right. I'm not appreciated, you're mm -hmm. not appreciated, I'm not appreciated. So what you start with is minimal. I'd like you to apologize. I choose not to, I can take no for an answer. Wow, no one got their eyebrows singed. And it's incremental like jujitsu, white belt, white belt, white belt, put a stripe on your white belt, more moves, more moves, more, put another stripe. And eventually when you're blue belt, you can talk about your feelings. Mm -hmm. So what I've discovered is many people, many people think they have higher belt skills, but the minute they try to use those, here's how I feel, I don't feel seen, I don't appreciate it, things escalate. So my job is de-escalation. I say, you will talk about your feelings when you both know how to talk about your feelings and you both know how to listen to the feelings of another person without getting defensive and then wanting to pile on, which is very typical. Mm -hmm. So you, you've intuited something correct. Many people don't like this. They say, I have to talk about my feelings. I said, can you wait a month? They say, no, I can't wait a month. I said, okay, so I'm not the guy. Hmm. Because this is stoicism, mm -hmm. right? What, what's the natural order of things? When things are spiraling apart, you don't get to say whatever you want. You gotta be careful until you build up trust, you build up a good rhythm for good communication and then learn how to introduce those things slowly. Hmm. So I, I'm a big believer in when, when things are careening out of control, everybody talk minimum. Hmm. So what do you say to the person who comes to you and says, you wouldn't believe what my 
ex-husband, ex-wife did, they're doing this, they're doing that and it's terrible and I don't get to see my kids. And uh, you know, they're telling all these other people, all these, li- there's a whole story, right? Mm-hmm. And there's an attachment to that story and there's a, um, a, a perverted kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, kind of attachment to how that story is received yeah. when told to friends, right. right? There's an out, you get affirmed like, oh, it's so bad mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you're right mm-hmm. and that person's wrong. No. Like yeah. teasing that apart mm-hmm. and trying to get to an objective truth with that person. Sure, so first thing I say, well, how's that going for you? Meaning having the story in your head and acting on it, is it producing what you want? Typically not. That story, those thoughts mm-hmm. is part of your, an ego self of blame. It's called the blame disruption. I'm gonna tell a story and there's a hero and there's a nemesis. I'm the hero, they're the nemesis. I'm good, they're evil. Now, let me tell you my story. We're all story. typically the hero in our own version exactly. of Exactly, we have events. to bust that up. Yeah. How do you bust it up? I call it the police report. I say, you are fighting on the front lawn, the cops arrive, so you stand there, you stand there. They take out their little notebook. They can't put more than on one little page. Notebook. What happened? Well, when I was coming home from work, no, what happened? Well, when I was a child, no, what happened? <laughs> okay, right. so you get what happened. So what I do for a person, I say, what happened? For a newcomer, it takes them more than half an hour to tell me what happened because their brains are in the accusatory narrative part of the brain as opposed to the objective brain. So notice ego self accusatory narrative, observer mind, shh, objective mind, what exactly happened? Now, when a person can tell me in a lean way what exactly happened, half the job is done because they've accessed a part of their brain that is not the emotional accusatory brain, which is the reporting brain. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, can you just give me like five sentences of what exactly happened? And they say, okay, so I did this and I say, okay, got it. So what would you prefer that they do instead of that? Uh, Well, I don't think they can. I said, that's okay. So now we're out of accusation to an ask, different part of the brain, different kind of virtue. I say, now what I'd like you is ask them. And they're gonna say no, I said, that's okay, they can say no. But instead of arguing, accusing, defaming, just ask them for what you'd like them to do and tell them you can take no for an answer. Hmm. And they're gonna say no. And you say, thank you for answering my question. Now their ego self just learned something. It's not a fight, it's just an ask. And they can take no for an answer. They, well, they keep saying no. I said, it's incremental. Start by your communications are low level, simple ask, simple answer, take no today. You do this, we'll get to more complex conversations. And, and they say, well, I don't believe it'll work. I said, give it a month. What you're doing so far hasn't produced any good. Yeah, but Rabbi, Rabbi Finley, you don't understand the reason why that makes me so upset when that person does that, you can't appreciate until I relate to you the entire history behind it. I say, go ahead. So I can give you the police report, but it's meaningless because you don't understand the context. Yeah. So I say, everybody gets their statutory 10 minutes to vent. So people vent. Thing is, I've heard it all before. So I'll say, so may I share with you now everything that each of you now have said from this point on? Cause I know the whole conversation cause everybody's the same. They have the exact right. same <laughs> conversations. I've never, <laughs> once they get into this mode, I know everything they're going to say. I, I know it sounds maybe a bit, bit dismissive, it's just true. You know, defensive people and accusatory people have the exact same conversations. So they say, oh, you need more background. I say, I actually don't, but if you need to give me more background, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to do it, but I'd love to get to work. Mm-hmm. And our situation is unique. I, I say, know you think you've heard it all before, but you don't really understand. Yeah, I say, okay, try me out. And they tell me and I go, it's a little bit unique, but not unique enough that I'm gonna change what I'm gonna tell you, which is no anger, no four C's, mm-hmm. police report, ask, answered, get everything down to minimum to learn how to process. I said, you tell me where, the, where, the, where this does not fit you guys. Cause this is approach of virtue, 
calm down the ego self, higher self-regulating ego self. What exactly do you want? Ask for it, take no for an answer and move forward. So I have found that when, um, you know, people are very attached to this is unique. I'm so angry. I say it won't get better if you stay angry or defensive. Mm -hmm. It's just not gonna get better. It's as if one day they go, oh, what you're saying is anger defensiveness won't help solve the problem. Bingo. But what they're saying makes me angry. I said, no, they're triggering the anger in you. That's your trigger. You disassemble your trigger, they cannot mm -hmm. make you angry. Yeah, you have control over that anger response. They don't feel they do, because they feel someone made me angry. So for a person to realize, they, they triggered your anger, but the trigger assembly is in you. Sure, and why are you giving that person that much power? Precisely, right? yeah. So when you get to that conversation, now we can get some work done. How long, with, a, with, a, with willing pupils, how long does that typically take? With willing people who are not, um, I, I'm gonna say in the first session, if they'll let me be in charge. Wow. If they'll let me be in charge, I, I give them everybody their 10 minutes of that. How many people let you be in charge? More, I'd say, you know, 60%, because yeah. I said, look, you came to me. So I'm gonna fix this for you, but you have to let me. And how is what you do different than what a, a traditional therapist would do? Because it's not ther therapy. It's right? not therapy, yeah. it's, it's wisdom coaching. A typical therapist would ask, how do you feel? And what feeling from the, what event in the past is being activated by this current situation? I'm not saying they're wrong. Many people are traumatized and they're driven by ghosts and demons. Everybody has them. This is not my specialty. Now I may refer a person to a therapist and say, you need to someone to excavate the ghosts, you know, the demons in, in, in you, mm -hmm. but interpersonally talk about your feeling to another person, usually, uh, escalates because we say you make me feel unseen. That is a kind of a criticism mm -hmm. and complaint, mm -hmm. whether you know it or not. So talk about that with your therapist because you may have to really do some excavating of demons. What I'm going to teach you is how to make this thing better if you will let me. And so people say, "Yeah, I actually heard that no one can make you mad." Only I said, "Yeah, it's actually true." So because everything I have, they've already heard somewhere, right? Uh -huh. These are people who read. Right. So I say, well, what are you doing different? I said, I train you. I'm gonna give you things you have to do every day. And if you don't do them every day, it's not gonna make any difference. So the next thing I ask you is, will you give me 10 minutes a day to train at home? Mm -hmm. Because my method does not work without training. If you're and not then, gonna train, I'm not the guy. <laughs> and then they can come to your Jewish dojo. That's right. You can I, put them through the paces. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I give people exercises. Uh -huh. You should give out belts. I do. You do? I mean, not real ones. Like you should no. I mean, like I have real ones. I, you know, I sometimes yeah. say to somebody, "Put a stripe on your belt." That was uh -huh. incredible. Like my spouse did this, this, and this. But you know, I remembered, Rabbi. Some people have bad days and don't take them so seriously and kind of let them get it out and say, "I'll talk to you later." I said, "Put a stripe on your belt." Uh -huh. And one day I said That's to a cool. person, "Put you got a blue belt like today." That. They go, "I." Did. It's like a blue belt at the studio. No, I don't deserve a blue belt. And <laughs> no, no, I said, "No, you you keep this up. You're a honest." Wisdom, virtue, blue belt, uh -huh. right? Um, be, because it's skills, I can see it. It's like at the rehab center. So, um, at the rehab center, sobriety is not about days, it's about uh, processing. So when I, you know, when there's a newbie in the room, you can tell by the way they process that they're not using, but they're not sober in the aspirational sense. Mm -hmm. And then they're there for a while and suddenly I watch them process differently. You know, and I'll, and then you start to see like a human being has come and the light is in their eyes and they show some wisdom. I go, wow, they're a blue belt. Wow. Whoa, that's a purple belt. That's like, that's not too often. Talk to me a little bit more about working with addicts and alcoholics. Like what does that look like and how does that mesh with 12 step? Well, I, I work at a fantastic place. Um, the founders are, uh, um, uh, he's actually my rabbinical assistant, a guy named Yeshaya Blakeney and his parents and others. Uh, they have doctorates in moral psychology. Uh, he grew up in the 12 step world and has a, a, a counseling degree from uh, Antioch, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. So they created a place that's based on uh, teaching people how to process well, in addition to 12 steps. So they brought me in to do this piece that I'm sharing with you. And they said, I said, look, I'm not a company man on 12 steps. I studied it, I know it, but mm -hmm. I really do my thing. They said, that's why, that's why you're on the, the faculty. 
So I have a group every Friday morning and um, I teach these things. I teach wall of virtue, four C's, bad Jedi, higher self, ego self. I, I mean, I, every day I come in with a, a skill and, um, uh, and I say, can you, can you recreate something that happened with a parent, a spouse, a child that made you wanna relapse? Mm-hmm. And can we process it through wisdom? And so that's a typical session is I'll, I'll present an idea and someone says, yeah, I wanna process this. And I, you know, uh, this made me so angry and this made me depressed. And I said, okay, so let's process it with higher self observing ego self and doing an intervention, coming out with something wise. So, uh, um, I mean, that's a, a bare bones sketch of what I do. Of sure. Course, what actually comes out in the room is sometimes quite but I would suspect there's a there's a great receptivity though, because anybody who's worked the steps, specifically the four step, knows how to perform an inventory mm-hmm. and has engaged oh, that muscle yeah. of trying to parse, you know, what's my part in every situation that occurs? Where can I find, you know, how I contributed to this, you know, terrible outcome? Where where am I displaying fear, anger, resentment, like all Precisely. greed, all of these sorts of things? Yeah, so twelve steps really helps them in that. So they're in many ways they're all already being propelled. Um, but I'll give you an example. So a, a guy borrowed the parents' car, and it ran out of gas. And so of course the parents, you're irresponsible. All this insults, and he flipped out. I said, okay, let's just go deep inside. Um, what did you want your parents to do or not do? I didn't want them to criticize me. I was in enough trouble already with a car out of gas. I said, got it. What's the likelihood that they are at this point in their lives, they would know how not to blame and accuse you when you did something they didn't like? Where are they at in their moral development? He said, it would be impossible for them. So your need, expectation, entitled man was not connected to reality. Mm -hmm. He says, what do I do? I said, you feel incredibly sad. Well, what do I say? Say, yeah, you're right. I should have been more thoughtful. Well, you're not responsible. I know I'm not responsible. Well, what are you doing about it? I'm in the recovery program. Well, don't you think you should be responsible by now? Yeah, I should be, but I'm working on it. Just deflect, 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 deflect. They're gonna calm down. And he said, well, and, and then afterwards you can say, hey, mom, dad, can I have a minute of your time? Sure, I want you to know, I really felt horrible when I ran out of gas. I know it's my old self that doesn't plan ahead, but I want you to tell me that when you guys piled on on me, a, a Pilot, it, it didn't feel good. It didn't, it didn't make it better for me. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you expect us to do? Right. That, that's all I needed to say. And then they come down to the center and we say, don't do that anymore. When your kid gets in trouble, you got a kid in trouble. This is not the day that the parents pile on. It's the day where the parents say, well, you probably feel bad enough already. What can we do? So sure. this is a whole retraining of the parent brain. Sure. But the Jedi from the perspective of the kid in recovery, the Jedi move is to not be ruffled by whatever the parents say. And, and I think there's, there's value in mining that need even deeper. It's not just, hey, you know, I don't, I don't want my parents to get mad at me. Like there's a deeper need, which is likely, you know, I've been a fuck up for a long time and I screwed up a lot of stuff and now I'm sober and I wanna be perceived as such and I can't get a break. Like no matter what I do, it's never gonna be yeah, good you're, enough you're, or you're, they're never gonna see me. You know, yeah, like, you're hundred percent right yeah. on, hundred percent right on. And, and that's where the conversation goes. Mm-hmm. When are they gonna give me a break? And I, I, I say, we're gonna have to work with you and your Jedi skill. And then we're gonna work with the parents and you're gonna be able to just sometimes say your little truth to the parents and say, I really am in a program and I'm really working it. And that, I would love it if you guys would give me a good word, be a little, little mm-hmm. bit patient with me because what you want sure. out of me is what I want out of me. And sometimes the parent says, wow, you're right. You are doing what we want you to do and we're not making it easy on you. And I mean, these are moments that are almost, almost miraculous mm-hmm. when the kid comes back to me and says, you would not believe the conversation I had with my father. Right. I was able to stay calm and say, hey dad, you're hundred percent right, but I'm working the program. And for the dad to say, I really apologize. It wasn't helpful, was it? Yeah. And the kid says, wow, it's just like a new dawn. Yeah, they, it seems like such a small thing, but that's a really big deal. Yeah, so managing yeah. that moment of anger and defensiveness, centering yourself, de- de-escalating. You're right, dad, you're right, mom. That was irresponsible of me. You're right. Well, what are you doing about it? I'm in recovery. 
Well, when are you gonna stop doing this? I hope soon. Well, why aren't you doing it now? Because I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah. It's like, they go, okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah. Right. So uh, you understand that when, 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 they, when they're, it's all guys, when uh, they learn this stuff, it's like, wow, I can just be calm, Jedi, deflect, deflect, de-escalate, and you come out of it. Mm-hmm. And then you start to go in with wisdom. So it's really, I mean, for the guys for whom this works, they are so grateful and transformed by the things that you and I are talking about here today. It's hard though. Oh, it, it, it takes a lot of work. I mean, especially when you're newly sober and you don't, you no longer can hide with your best friend and you don't have that coping mechanism. You're just this live wire ready to pounce at anything. Yes, yeah, so and that's everything's where, on the surface. And that's where the um, place where I, where I teach recover integrity. Uh, it's a warm community of um, people can be vulnerable with each other. They've learned how to talk and trust. It's an excellent faculty. So this is where the friend they would talk to, they're all working the program. Right. And the faculty were all of one mind. I mean, we have all different approaches, but um, I mean, I really believe in this. You know, when I look at the transformation that I have seen, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one part of the thing. I think I have an important part, um, but people get better. Mm-hmm. And it's an, it's an- It's beautiful to witness it's beautiful that. Beautiful to witness it. And over many years, I've seen that unfold in lots of different people. And it, it just, there's nothing more encouraging or heartwarming than seeing that light go on mm-hmm. in somebody else. And then over time watching their, li- their life, not just change, but, but flourish. Mm-hmm. It's truly miraculous. It really is. And so this is a, a quasi religion, which means you have a community, you have a text, you have rituals, you have a teaching, you have novices moving up through the program. So you got a book too. You got a book. Yeah. You got a, you got a Bible. <laughs> yeah. So I get it. I get it. Yeah. I um I admire it greatly. Mm-hmm. And all I can what I add to it is the outsider um you know um virtue, rationality, wisdom, depth. So I have my own take on each of the 12 steps. So I said, we're gonna talk about this step today, but I wanna give you my take on it. So it's right. a- That's cool. Yeah, That's cool. I learned a lot. I, 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 I wouldn't be doing yeah. this, if this if if every time I taught some part of my soul wasn't opened up. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's transformative working yeah. with people who are doing the work. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, I wanna shift gears a little bit sure. here. I wanna spend a few minutes talking about Kabbalah. Okay. Could we do that? Absolutely. I'm fascinated by this, probably in large part because I know very little about it okay. other than that at some point there was a, a, a cultural inflection point that involved Madonna and a lot of people wearing uh, red strings on their wrists. Yeah. And I know it's, it's a, you know, it's a, a a journey into mysticism on some level and also, you know, steeped in, in Jewish tradition, but help, help me understand this by unpacking it a little okay. bit. So I wanna share with you a quip that a friend of mine said, and I, I borrowed, he taught a course called Kabbalah, no red strings attached. Uh-huh. So that's my approach. <laughs> yeah. Kabbalah, no red strings attached. Right. Okay. You're not allowed to walk around in the world and advertise that you're, uh, and they have no efficacy. Part of <laughs> if, if you're in, what the, is the re, what is that about? It's an amulet. Mm. So I'm not in the amulet Kabbalah. There, there is a big part of Kabbalah which is amulets. It's a very big thing in the Middle East. I'm not into amulets. You know, little hamsa signs and you know things you put on your bed or around your neck or on your. I just, I just, I'm not in that world. Uh-huh. So I'm more in the um, the hard work Kabbalah. Like it's a way to do the work, not the magical Kabbalah, which is put a red string to protect yourself. Okay, so I say, okay, fine, if it works, I don't know if it works, but if it works, great, but that's not what I do. So let me try to give you the, a basic um, understanding. For anybody who wants to understand Kabbalah, they have to understand Plato and Platonism with the idea that there are these ideal forms. Let's take the example of justice. And let's say there's something called justice in the mind of the infinite and it percolates down through lenses and then it gets to a human being. And for them, justice is uh, whatever I want. Like a little kid saying, that's not fair, meaning I didn't get what I wanted. That's a pretty low level. 
And then justice is whatever the law says, or justice is whatever benefits my group. And so there's, you might higher and higher ideation of what justice and fairness is. You ask your average person, they actually can't go very, very high up the ladder of ideation because they're just not trained. Mm-hmm. But try to imagine that a tra- I have a doctorate in social ethics. So I'm, I'm, I'm steeped in moral philosophy. So I know how to climb that ladder and people find it exhilarating. So try to imagine there's the mind of the infinite that emanates a metaphysical concept down the ladder, through the prisms, through the lenses until it gets to human consciousness. Most people start out at a very low level of consciousness, and, but they can climb up. It's called the, the chain of being. Mm-hmm. The Kabbalah is rooted in a similar idea called the, the emanations. So if you, if you type in your browser, the emanations of the Kabbalah, they're called the Sefirot, S-E-F-I-R-O-T. Type that in, you're gonna see these 10 emanations, that is the Kabbalah. If you have those 10 emanations, it's Kabbalah. If you don't have it, it's not Kabbalah. So the first thing about Kabbalah, it's an emanatory system from the infinite mind of God that emanates these, these, these powers, these values, um, as it were, into the consciousness of the human being. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's the first step. Okay. So the next step should be pretty obvious is just if we are created in God's image, then just as this happens in the divine is happening in us. So everybody has their own copy of the 10 emanations. And so my job is to work my 10 emanations. Um, I'll just add one more step. There's a Kabbalistic teaching that as some of these emanations are cracked, broken and flawed as they get into the human being. So what is my life's work? To repair my emanations. It's a way of ordering the inner life. Now I'm talking about the spiritual psychology of the Kabbalah, not mm-hmm. the, I mean, not the hundred hours of teaching I could give if I were teaching it more academically, but you're, I think you're asking what's the practical usage. Mm-hmm. It's a way to understand the mind of God and human consciousness in these 10 emanatory mm. systems. In other words, finding a way to tether the flawed human consciousness or, and, and relate it in some way to the infinite. Yes, um, this very well put from a spiritual psychological perspective. For example, one of the emanations is called chesed, which means love, beneficence, loving kindness. So let's say I have a emanation in me that is love mind. But then I look and I realize some of my acts of love are actually after reciprocity. Sometimes I'm trying to be super accommodating. Sometimes I'm trying to manipulate somebody by being a nice guy. Mm-hmm. That's lower level stuff. Mm-hmm. So that's cracked. Another one is called Gavura, which has to do with judgment and rationality. Lowest level is prejudgment or prejudice. Yeah, I have a judgment, but it's all messed up. It produces hatred. So notice in each one of these emanations, for example, love on one side, judgment on the other. They're, this is Finley's teaching. They have higher and lower manifestations. Right, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So each one of these, now this is my adaptation. There's an ideal and then there's the human manifestation of that at various levels. Correct. So I have to have a theory of what is the, what is the ideal idea of love? So if people ask me, I say, well, it has to do with service, truly benefiting another person, which is not what I think they want. And maybe even not what they think they want. Mm-hmm. It's complex. And that's another part of my spiritual psychology is the, the willingness to think complexly because most people wanna simplify. I say as simple as possible, but don't avoid complexity. So thinking about love, thinking about rationality, about justice. So these are two, they merge into one called truth and beauty. So deep meditation on truth. What do we mean by truth? What does it mean to be a true human being? What does it mean to know the truth? What is beauty? These are deep conversations. Mm-hmm. So try to imagine, uh, I'm talking about the lower seven now. These are the, the, the non-mystical ones. Studying the lower seven is exhilarating. It, it's a curriculum to think about the deepest things of human consciousness in an orderly way with other people who know the terms. So for me, the Kabbalah is a way to study human consciousness in a relatively contained system with other people who know the, who know mm-hmm. the jargon. Mm-hmm. So it's mm-hmm. exhilarating. Mm-hmm. It's also transformational, meaning as I study them, it's ways of uh, self-understanding 
and a standard for growth. Mm -hmm. So emanatory system that has a spiritual psychological dimension that in some ways sets out a curriculum for lifetime inner work. Yeah, that's cool. So in the context of love, for example, there's divine love, the sun doesn't choose upon which it's going to shine on. It mm-hmm. shines, you know, equanimously on mm-hmm. everything versus transactional love or a, a relationship that's really a social contract and all the various permutations in between on this escalating scale towards a more divine expression yeah, of or love. agape, love your neighbor as yourself. Right. Yeah. So so all the more you know about the word in as many languages as you know, in and then including philosophy, psychology, different kinds of psychology. So whenever, let's say I'm gonna study that sphera, chesed, I invite people, bring in everything you know, mm-hmm. and let's create a theory that, that seems about right, and then let's assess ourselves. So if I say, I love my wife, I love my children, does that mean, um, for many people, now that I love you, here's what you must do. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conditional love, yeah. which which most relationships on some level are a function of. Yeah, but even we say th- we love you know so and so no matter what, but they go off and they murder somebody or either, yeah. you know so like that's, you're out. So yeah, that's a metaphor. Yeah. That's not real. But I'm even speaking with a person that says, now that I love somebody, here are their duties. Mm-hmm. That, that that actually happens. So I say, no. How about if now that I love somebody, here are my duties. Well, what about what they have to do? I said, we'll get there. But that even gets more complicated because service is self-serving in many ways. Like I feel better when I'm in service. So how much of my pull to service is motivated by my personal or, or, or selfish desire well, to feel you. better versus well, being completely altruistic? Yeah, but a consequence is not a motivation. So if you know that when you serve somebody, you know the consequences will be inner well-being. that's not your motivation. Mm-hmm. You have to distinguish between motivations and outcomes. So the outcome of service is well-being, but that's not my motivation. My motivation is to serve other people. Mm-hmm. I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna question that. So a person says, well, what if I'm really only doing it for the good feeling afterwards? I said, well, are you? Sometimes. Sometimes, okay, so yeah. that's pretty good sometimes. Yeah. That's like, yes, like a C. But I think being honest about that is important. And that's, you know, in part, based upon the way you just described it, it feels like Kabbalah in certain respects is, a path towards disabusing uh, humans of the delusions that we commonly harbor about our actions and why we behave the it, it way that can we do. Be. I mean, in the way that I teach it. So if we're gonna talk about love and service and a person says, but I don't know if my motivations are clean. I said, that's a great conversation to have. And if that's the conversation you need to have, let's have it. Mm-hmm. How do you understand the depth of your own motivation? If that's what's haunting you, let's have that conversation. Mm-hmm. So are you the type that believes that all motivations are narcissistic? They go, yeah, aren't they? I say, no, they're not. You asking me? No, some motivations are pure. Sometimes we truly want to help other people. And if you're asking me as the rabbi, don't doubt that because it's true. Sometimes we are motivated to serve others. Now, if you say, well, I don't know when, I say, great, then that's, that is what we're gonna do with chesed. So notice sometimes when I teach chesed, the person, said, the person will reveal to me very quickly, here's what I need to study. Yeah. Um, same thing with gavura, boundary setting. But Rabbi Finley, when I draw a boundary, it makes other people feel bad. I, is it a righteous boundary? Yes. I said, so what do you feeling bad have to do with it? I don't know, I just don't like to disappoint people. I said, great, so now we know what to talk about. Mm-hmm. So because I've been studying this forever, uh, by the way, not that I but can- But there's a narcissism it. in that. that Always. you harbor the power to make somebody else feel poorly. There you go. So you see, you're right <laughs> on it. See, you're, you, so if I were to study this with you, you would bring a set of questions to every single one of them that need to be addressed. But these 10 emanations give us the curriculum of which questions. Mm-hmm. So if we're studying love, we'll have one set of questions. If we're studying justice and rationality and judgment, we'll have a different set of questions. So this is the beautiful thing about it is when we're studying the spiritual psychology of the Kabbalah, we're studying this one today. Now they all interconnect obviously, but you see the two things you just brought up, they're fabulous questions, but why would we have them? Because I'm doing the spiritual psychology of the Kabbalah. So sometimes when I study with a person, they go, oh my God, this is like what you do? I see, yeah, that's what I do. Yeah, but I wanna wear the red bracelet so that everybody knows what I'm I'm up to. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Right. You know, (laughs) 
people got to do what they got to do, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not judgmental about that stuff. Your your strain of this is called Lurianic, right? It, so yeah. explain that a little bit. Okay, so Isaac Luria. So the Kabbalah develops in the uh, late 1100s, 1200s, um, and Isaac Luria added a dimension that these emanations that we're talking about cracked and broke. So he added the idea of the breaking of the vessels. Okay. Right. So it's as it were, as it were, the mind of God that we can apprehend shattered. So we therefore are each articulations of the shattered mind of God. I know it's a strange theology. So how do we heal God? By healing the shattered vessels within us. Mm, I like that. That's Isn't beautiful. it great? I don't pray for God to heal me. God wants me to heal God. Mm. How do I heal myself? Repair my vessels. That's how I heal God. That's how I heal you. If you and I have a relationship and we both know we come with shattered vessels, let's help each other. And in doing so, we heal God. So it's ultimately humanistic because the focus is not on, oh God, please, but rather God, you gave me a duty to repair the vessels. I'll spend my life trying to repair my vessels and help other people. At the end of my life, I'll show you my work. Well, there's a, there's a Zen Buddhism flair to that in that the path forward is, is really an internal journey of becoming the most fully authentic version of yourself. You nailed it. So this is a path toward authenticity, inner work, moral growth, guided by the system of the spiritual psychology of Kabbalah. And when people say, oh, so I found something wrong with me. I said, no, you found out the nature of the, your shattered vessels. And that's why on um, character defect. And what a beautiful, what a beautiful epiphany and a great place to begin yes. this journey. When right? I say to people, I say, there's nothing wrong with you. You discovered your work. I mean, that really relieves mm-hmm. people. And that's one reason when we do the character defect in, in the 12 step, I say, if I may, we don't have defects, we have work. I know 12 step, you gotta do it. Are we talking to Finley? I don't like that word. What I like is I've discovered the work I need to do. Mm which means you, st- you discovered your configuration of the brokenness of God. And now you're called upon to work on it. There's nothing wrong with you. You discovered your participation in the brokenness of God, get to work. Mm. So for me, it's, um, it takes away the shame of, oh my God, this is wrong with me. I'm bad at this. And you know, uh, you know I'm not an iron man and say, it's okay. Yeah. You just discovered your work. That's okay. Wow. We just discovered your work. And yeah, we that's really cool how that how that intersects with recovery. Absolutely. Yeah. All you've done is discover your work. There's nothing wrong with you. Mm-hmm. So for me to say, guys, I'm such a fuck up, I said, no, you're not. You discovered your work. You've been avoiding your work. Yeah. I get it. Uh huh. But you discovered your work. Let's just yeah. get to work. You avoided your work. The universe has been knocking. It starts knocking a little bit louder. God until, saying, God's saying, please. Until Finley shows up. Yeah. Call, God is saying, please heal me. No, I'd rather drink. God says, I really need you to heal me. See, this is where like, I don't, I That's mean. It's such a flip isn't on it? how isn't I've ever flip? always thought about that. Yeah. yeah, so I'm not saying don't say, turn over to higher power, but rather the higher power is saying, please heal me. Only you can do it. Hmm. Yeah, so it's a, so. There's a, there's a, in just pondering that, there's, a, there's like this infusion of agency, right? You, you like got that. it, man, you got it. it uh, now this is Finley's interpretation of Luriana Kabbalah. But for me, Luriana Kabbalah produces a powerful degree, exactly as you said, of human agency. God needs me to heal God. It's up to me and we're gonna do this together. And as we heal each other and heal God, that actually makes the whole human condition better if enough of us are doing it. So it's, um, so when people discover this, I mean, you know, I, uh, I've had people break down in tears when they heard, there's nothing wrong with you. You've discovered your work. Mm. Some I suspect would find it blasphemous though. The oh, yeah. idea of man healing God is outrageous. <laughs> yeah. I've had people walk out of my yeah. synagogue when I said it. Yeah. I said, it's okay, go study with some other rabbi. So we're, I say to people, this is, I, this, I'm in the spiritual psychological Lur, Neo-Lurianic, mm-hmm. Neo-Kabbalistic tradition. It's this, it's this thing that I do. Yeah. I'm not telling anybody they have to do it. I'm just telling people what I do. Yeah. And if you like it, join in. Right. 
Um, we got to wind this down okay. in a couple of minutes, but I do I do want to ask you about one more thing, which sure. is uh, it, it's somewhat related to my Zen Buddhism comment, which is that uh, you had um, Leonard Cohen in your he was orbit, a, he was a right? congregant, yeah. And I know you tell an amazing story about how you guys met. Can yeah. you share that with us? Uh, well, I'll tell you what happened. Um, the person who produced uh, uh, Anjani, his, his, his woman, wife, woman, uh, blue alert, this guy named Larry Klein. Uh, Larry's a member of the congregation and Larry and Luciana got married, invited me to their wedding. Mm-hmm. So I asked Larry, Larry and Luciana asked me, what do you recommend for entertainment? We don't wanna do like the old thing. I said, well, have a few cool people talk about the wisdom of marriage. They say, okay, you, All right? So I was centered, seated next to Leonard. I didn't know who he was. I heard the name Leonard Cohen. It didn't, it didn't ring any bells or anything. Yeah. So then I got up and did my thing. So I had this little shtick that I did. 10 contrarian commandments for good marriage. So remember that, uh, be happy, don't worry. Yeah. So I said, worry, cause it was actually a Jewish spiritual practice, which is worry about if you're a virtuous person, not worry about outcomes, worry about yourself. And then instead of be, being angry, be sad. So I said, forget about, uh, don't worry, be happy. And then I explained, uh, be sad and worry, but I translated <laughs> into Jewish spiritual psychology. Okay. You wanna be a good person, worry about yourself. Don't get angry, be sad that you're not getting your way. So I went through these 10 contrarian commandments of a good marriage. And I got, I got a lot of laughs, a lot of depth, and people lined up to talk to me like to, at the wedding reception. And I sat down and Leonard Cohen says, you know, that was really cool. You know? So he, he, he and Anjani really dug it. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, I go home and call my wife who's in Israel. And I said, hey, ever heard this guy, Leonard Cohen? She said, I used to cry at night listening to his albums, right? You know, I said, I didn't know who he was, I'm sorry. She yeah. said, you sat next to Leonard Cohen. I said, I didn't know. So he, he and Anjani walk into the synagogue the next Sabbath. And they just start coming to the synagogue and mm-hmm. attending all my classes. And we became, we four became good friends and mm-hmm. he and I became very connected and I was his rabbi. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, all I can say he was, um, we weren't chummy because we felt a little bit awkward around each other unless we studied something. So he really knew Kabbalah very well. Um, he clearly has the gift of a muse. Uh, I got the inner, life of his poetry. So son, you come to me and say, he says, hey, Reb, uh, uh, you wanna hear a poem I've been working on? I say, sure. He goes, so how long have you been working on? He says, 15 years. Yeah. I said, uh, how long is he? He has 120 verses. I said, I got time. You know, it's like, uh-huh. So, you know, and I would say, I, my favorite song is Bird on a Wire. He goes, oh, you wanna hear the rest of the verses? So, I mean, all of his songs wow. have, have hundreds of verses, right? So we had a great connection. You know, I, I, was, I say he wasn't my friend. But um, based on philosophy, philosophy and discourse. And he wanted a teacher. I knew what he wanted because of, in the Buddhist world where, you know, consciousness gets emptied out and, you know, meditation is a tuning fork to reality. He wanted a guy that actually taught moral realism and the world is real. And there really is a divine interfacing with human beings. And it was not what he believed, but he liked being in a relationship with mm. somebody, with a rabbi that did not tell him what he believed. Right, to stress test his ideas. And for me to tr- stress test mine on him. Mm-hmm. And he loved hearing what I had to say. It was an interesting mm. thing. He, I think he wanted a rabbi who meant it in the deepest way imaginable. And he, he thrived on it and I thrived on him. So. People ask me about his music. I said, look, I'm not an expert on Leonard Cohen music. And, and we were friends to a point. I was his rabbi. I don't have anything more to say. Right. And he, he characterized himself as more of a Zen Buddhist. Well, he said, right? he or, said, Zen Buddhism is not a religion. It's a tuning fork for consciousness. He says, my religion is Judaism, right? And he said, and you're the best rabbi I ever met. Beautiful. So I said, okay. So yeah. I never asked him about Zen Buddhism. He, he you know, like, you don't say to Leonard Cohen, where did you get the ideas for your songs and tell me about mm-hmm. Buddhism. He came to me to be his rabbi. So I got to find out what are you looking for? And can I do it? And what he was looking for, I could do. And that was our relationship. Wow. So it was, people say, what was it like? I said, I was his rabbi. I don't know how many more times <laughs> to explain it. It's like, what do I do to anybody choosing to be their rabbi? What are you yeah. after? 
can I do it? All right, let's get to it. What a cool experience though. It really was. Yeah. He was one of the, man, just, you know, one time I said to him, I said, uh, as I started really reading his poetry, I said, you know, Leonard, I think uh, most of your poetry is liturgy. He says, I thought all my poetry is liturgy. Mm. You want to know which parts weren't? Yeah, like what, are you, like, what are you saying, you know? And so then when I realized that he sees, he saw himself as being in the line of King David, the, you know, the Psalms, yeah. and then all these great liturgists uh, through the years, people who wrote all this beautiful liturgy of the Hebrew tradition, he saw himself as in that chain of tradition. Mm. He says, I'm a liturgist. Mm. I write poetry about God and for God and for people who want to sing to God. Mm. So that was what alerted me to what's happening with him. And um, uh, it was extraordinary. It really was, um, I, I miss him yeah, terribly. He was, he a was gift. something that the kind of person to be around and talk to was just um, utterly unique. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was nice because he really loved my wife. They, they had a very cool relationship. Uh, Lynn and I were a little bit awkward with each other. She got him, he's a ladies' man, uh -huh. and my wife got him quickly. And he couldn't pull his thing on her. Uh -huh. So he felt safe with her. <laughs> She's, yeah, Leonard, yeah, whatever. You know, like, and so he felt so safe with my wife. They really had a mm. beautiful relationship. Mm. And then my wife became best friends with Anjani. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, uh, you might not know this, but I'm actually awkward socially, you know? So between the three of them, they had all this love going on. I'm kind of like- You're the guy, on the outside. I kind of like the guy watching this. Like, hey, this. I'm the one who he came to. No, 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 no. I don't have any of that. I know <laughs> yeah. I'm awkward. I, I know I'm a socially awkward person. And um, sometimes best thing for me is just to sit back and watch the magic. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not reading a lot of social awkwardness today. I know because you. I'm on. Yeah. I'm, uh, this you is my on. happy place, but- you know, like if, if we sat socially, I'd run out of things to uh, say. You know, it's like <laughs> I have a hard time believing that. Um, okay, but we do have to end this All right. final thing. Right. Uh, I think it would be good to just end this with a few thoughts for the person who's listening or watching who is tiptoeing around the idea of what it means to be a spiritual being having a human experience. Is trying to you know reckon with finding a little bit more meaning and purpose in their lives and doesn't have the vernacular or the experience to really do this by themselves. Like, how do you? Sure, I love the metaphor. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's a very available metaphor, a spiritual being having a human experience, is that what mm -hmm. you said? But to mean that takes a tremendous amount of work because you have to go to your spiritual center and that is the most and only real thing. And getting to that spiritual center, um, you know, to the, to the place deep in the inner life where the love of God is flowing in through the fountain and you're standing right there in the fountain. Okay, you're at the deepest part of the soul and you come up that, out of that and you have a, one urge, which is to love other people. And anything that gets in the way of that, you gotta stop it and love life and create beauty. So, so many things come from rooting yourself into the deepest part of what I, I will call uh, the life of spirit, which for me as a religious person is the interface between the, 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 you know, the mind of God and the mind of the human being or the soul of the universe and the soul of the human being. Now, when you get there, um, it's not as if you have meaning, meaning has you. This is one thing I really believe deeply. We like to say I have meaning in my purpose in life, but if you really feel it, it arrives at you and it grabs you by the lapels and it owns mm. you. So I don't have meaning, meaning has me. I don't have purpose, purpose has me, it's claimed me. You know, going back to the stoic sense. So when you feel claimed by love, justice, truth and beauty that propels you, now that we have claimed you, here's what you must do. So what happens is that deepest sense of being claimed by the divine, I'm speaking as a religious person, when God claims you in the garments of love, justice, truth, and beauty and pushes you into life, well, now you know how to be a human. And what you have to do is you have to, be, you have to live interfacing in the world, propelled by the meaning and purpose that has claimed you. For me, in the modalities of love, justice, truth, and beauty, but always go back 
to that deep experience of the soul. So it's a constant dialectic between, you know, being present in the world and being present to the soul, present to the world, being present to the soul. So the person who's hearing this and says, how do I do that? You know, I would say, think deep things, you know, what is love? What is beauty? What is truth? Just start taking your consciousness and drilling through the block between the mind and the soul and drill down. I, mean, I remember it happening to me when I thought, well, I have these holy words and knowing that they had soul resonance and drilling down through that granite block. And one time, and when I hit the water and the water just flowed up, uh -huh. that's what I want to tell people. Yeah, that's beautiful. I think there is a uh, epidemic of people feeling a desire for, but a lack of that animating force. And right. I think for those that lack it or are seeking it, that was beautifully put this idea of it claiming you, but in order to put yourself in a position to be so claimed, you have to commit to living an examined life and understand that patience is going to be important That's because it's not, a, it's not a light switch. The examined life you have to examine the contents of consciousness and go to the deepest place you can and do it every day. And that you'll hit the waters, you'll hit the living waters of the soul. Mm. Just keep at it. It's a good way to end it, All I right, think. Man. I think we landed this plane. We landed the plane. Yeah, how do you feel? <laughs> I feel great. That I was good. terrific. You're terrific. I loved it. Let's do this again. Absolutely, man. You're can I come man. to your you synagogue too? I'd like to hear you. Want, of course. Do your thing. I would be, be so honored. And this was really, this is, we did a significant thing here today. You think so? Absolutely. I hope so. I Absolutely. hope it's helpful to people. Yeah. I loved, I loved it. I loved every minute you're, of it. You're thank right you. in the zone too. So it's a really, it's an honor to be interviewed by you truly. Oh, thank you. Um, if people want to connect with you, what's the best well, place to send uh, my them? My synagogue, oratora.org, mm -hmm. my website, rabbifinley.com. It's all very, 90s clunky and mm -hmm. you know we're promising to upgrade it and one day have a room like this <laughs> this wonderful studio you have and i got so much to do and so much to say um but in the meantime uh i have my classes uh on tuesday and wednesday nights on zoom about 45 minutes right. each uh my shabbat evening a 20 minute teaching on friday night an hour teaching on saturday morning open to everybody many people are not jewish because i don't teach judaism i teach using Jewish symbols, metaphors, and myths as a way to get at truth. Right. So everybody's welcome. And I think any person like you would love it. Excellent, I'm gonna check it out okay. and I'll put all those links in the show notes. Yeah, thank uh, you. So everybody can figure it out and hopefully okay. send a few new people your all way. All right. All right, yeah. thanks so much. All right, man, it's been a pleasure, real Peace. pleasure, thank you. Lance.